Well, hello, welcome. I hope everything works. You know how this is. You guys know the drill. You've been doing this long enough. We are doing an interview today, and this one's exciting. Uh, the, we haven't had an Army attack helicopter pilot on since CASMO, and this one has so much in store. We are interviewing Daniel Flores, author of the book, South of Heaven, My Year in Afghanistan. He's got a movie. He has flown Apaches, he's flown Cobras, he's flown uh, Customs, and without further ado, we are going to add him to the stream and hope that everything works. I hope everybody can hear me, and if you can't, just let me know, because whatever. Hello, Daniel. How are hey, you, sir? Hey, Hoover. How are you? <laughs> Good. Hold on. Switch sides for you. There we go. How are you today? Thank you for uh, appearing on the channel. I know. So the backstory, this is really interesting. I got this in a mover mailbag a long time ago, pre-COVID. And then for the longest time, we were going to do something, but we couldn't get, you were still flying for customs and you know, there was a little bit of scheduling stuff. So finally, we've got internet. We've got everything we need we can finally have our chat. Thank you for, for agreeing to, to do this interview. Oh, thanks for having me on board there, Mover. This is uh, actually really exciting for me. Been watching your videos for, geez, over two or three years now. Great videos. Uh, so you know the drill. You've seen how, how this works, where I'll probably end up freezing or falling offline or something. So that's good, that's good, that's good. We're already, we're already there. Uh, I'm trying this new software, so if it starts to give you uh, epilepsy, let me know. Um, but let's get right into it because we've got a lot to cover. Um, first of all, you're a helicopter pilot. Do you do any fixed wing stuff or, 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 or what are your, what is your basic aircraft background as of right now? I, um, I first started, I got my, uh, private pilot airplane rating back in 1989. And, uh, once I got that, I was like, well, flying's a lot of fun. So I, uh, was in what was the original ab initial program with Continental Airlines back then in a college down here in South Houston that uh, if you got all your ratings and airplanes um, they would set you up with an interview with a commuter airline back then called Bar Harbor. Um, oh, wow. Talked to a Navy, uh, a real good friend of mine that flew intruders in the Navy and uh, at the time he had actually just gotten on with the South with Southwest Airlines at its uh, beginning and I asked him, how does somebody get that much jet time to get on with the airlines? And he said, have somebody pay for you. So um, <laughs> unbelievably, works. at that time, the, um, the Army Reserves was coming up with a brand new uh, Apache helicopter unit up here in Conroe, Texas. I applied, got accepted. And so for then 1991 to 1990, uh, 1990 to 91, uh, I went to flight school, came out flying the Cobra helicopter, and went back after about a year and a half and got into the Apache. So, and then after that, being in the reserves, I went back and finished all my fixed wing ratings, uh, obviously private commercial instrument multi-engine. And uh, so, I was an airplane pilot first, and but a helicopter pilot for the most part. Wow. So let, let's start from that. Did you like flying as a kid? Did you have family members that were into flying or were you just, you looked up in the sky one day and you're like, I want to do that. How'd you get into aviation? Literally what you just said, looked up in the sky. <laughs> I had, um, I was going to college. Uh, I said kind of like a lot of other people, not knowing really what I wanted to, to do with life. And after about three years, uh, my dad said like, Hey, this, uh, fully paid, party time is over with. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so I said I was going to join the Army, and he had me talk to a friend of his that was a Green Beret in Vietnam, and he told me, hey, look, go in the Army, go for as minimal time as you can, and uh, get the college fund, college bonus, and go infantry. That way, you know what the real military is about, not a cook, truck driver, or whatever it happens to be, but infantry. And if you like it, you can re-enlist. If you don't, you only spent two years of your life doing that and you got the college fund. And that's what I did. Um, got out and ended up get, getting into a National Guard unit while I was going to college that uh, was long range recon patrol unit. Um, and we were at Fort Hood one summer, hotter than hell, ticks, chiggers, <laughs> the whole nine yards. And, uh, and I heard a helicopter in the background. And so I came out from behind a bush because obviously we're <laughs> hiding. And, uh, and there was a cobra, 
and he did a little impromptu air show for us right there. Um, he, he they just kind of circled us, came to a hover, and I was taking pictures of him. And then right before he left, he points at his watch, does the drinking sign, and says he's got to go. And I thought, wow. <laughs> it's beer 30. That's the way to go. <laughs> so um, that was that was in 1988. So right after that, like I said, I went to college, uh, that ab initio program, and uh, yeah, went uh, went to the army after that. So and then it wasn't until uh, 1999 uh, I had applied for U.S. Customs back then, and a friend of mine that was in the reserves. Uh, he was a night stalker, the Army's special ops unit. He said, hey, man, uh, you fly good. You're a good kid and all this sort of stuff. You ought to come apply uh, with customs for us. So looked it up and uh, applied. Took about three years, but uh, finally got on board. And uh, so there I got to fly the Citation jet as an interceptor. It had the APG-66 radar, but wow, uh, yeah. definitely first rate or first generation software. But... Um, Got to fly that, and uh, down South America and Mexico, chasing drug runners all over the United States and awesome. all that sort of stuff. And then they, uh, I got to fly the A Star helicopter for them, chasing drug runners and illegals down on the border. Uh, did that for 21 years, and at the same time, I was flying the Apache. So living the dream. I mean, literally <laughs> flying jets, flying both civilian helicopter, well, I say civilian law enforcement helicopters. And still flying the Apache helicopter, so Jeez. that's pretty much how I got in. And that's uh, and then now, as you had asked before, um, I did 21 years. This time last year, retired, and um, ended up getting a full-time EMS job flying here in the Houston area, flying the EC-145. So part-time. You need you need a movie about all this <laughs> drug runners and stuff. That's awesome. Well, yes. I, I'm gonna go back to back to when you you started flight school. So, um, <clears throat> I didn't realize. I guess a lot of people don't realize that the, the Guard Reserve, you know, exists on the Army side as well. You know, I talk about Guard Reserve as an option for fighter pilots and you know tankers and heavies and stuff. But you said you didn't know. How'd you end up flying the Cobra if you got hired? You didn't apply to a specific unit. Was it just Texas Guard or Army Reserve, and they just put you wherever they need you? No, that's still the best kept secret about the reserves and the guard. You apply for wherever you want to go. If they hire you, it's for that specific aircraft. When the unit started, they only had Cobras. Ah, and okay. they, they were not going to get Apaches for another, it was like three years. Mm -hmm. So I knew going into flight school that I was going to fly the Apache in the long run. But the Army flight school back then, they had what's called multi-track. Everybody starts off at that time in the Huey. Uh, through flight school, basic flight instruments, night vision goggles, and uh, basic combat training, whatever. But uh, after all, everybody does the same thing, and then everybody splits up and does either um, Blackhawks or Kiowa Warriors, like Casmo did, and then uh, or Apaches, like I did, or uh, Chinooks. And so everybody splits up on that part. I knew I was getting Apaches, but uh, back then it was the Cobra was the route to the Apache. That is awesome. So uh, you were a fixed wing guy at this point. How, how was the transition? What was it like first time you had to hover? And like, how, how was that for you? <laughs> it's kind of like how you had it. It, it was, <laughs> uh, you really don't appreciate a helicopter until the tower says, get off the runway right now. And the instructor, Lester, the instructor says, pick it up to a hover, get off the runway. And you pick it up to a hover and you fly over the grass, over the ditch, and everything else. You're like, wow, <laughs> this is cool. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's just a blast. Um, I did have, I wouldn't say uh, problems, transitioning to the jet. The Harrier instructor, uh, Cookie, uh, he was a Marine Corps guy that flew Harriers. Uh, we were coming into land and he said, pull power in his uh, he was thinking, bring the power back. Mm -hmm. When he said pull power, I was thinking helicopters, so that means pull the collective up and adding more power. So I just right. added a little more throttle, and he's going like, pull power. I'm like, good God, all right. And uh, <laughs> so I had more power, and he's going like, I said, pull power. I'm like, 
holy mackerel, man, we're going to be doing, you know, 180 on, you know, short final. And he's going to bring the throttle back. So uh, we talked about that afterwards. But that's the only time I've really ever um, eh, had a little bit of an issue with that. Um, flying fixed wing, though, absolutely helped out in combat in Afghanistan because you had to fly the Apache um, like a fixed wing. There, really? It, yeah, didn't have with a full combat load and everything. At uh, our average fight was around eight thousand feet, ten thousand feet above sea level. Mm -hmm. um, the aircraft could not come to a hover, so basically I treated it as you get below about thirty, forty knots, it's going to stall like an airplane and come out of the sky. So you just fly it like a jet. You bring in the power, and uh, you got to conserve wow. your energy on your turns, on your dives and climb outs and stuff. So. That's where fixed wing really helped out on that. What model of a uh, Cobra did you transition to first? Uh, the original, the F model and the prod models were at uh, flight school. The ones we had here in Conroe were the S model, which had the uh, six barrel minigun, the 7.62 <laughs> uh, minigun, 6,000 rounds a minute. And then the, the 40 millimeter uh, grenade launcher next to it on the turret. Nice. Oh, it was Oh, man, dude. Okay. So on um, got back from flight school and we went to Arkansas for our gunnery and uh, the instructor in the back goes like, okay, so you've got a hundred uh, grenades you're going to shoot and uh, and you got I use something like what 2000 rounds of a uh, 7.62. So he said, yeah, give it the 7.62 on this uh, Connex out there. And all you hear is a little buzz and the aircraft just got a little buzzing feel to it and you're look out there it's like shooting a laser beam uh all the tracers that are in there going down range it's just like one long string of tracers mm -hmm. you know even though the, every what every fifth one is a tracer uh and i thought wow that's cool and then he said okay uh give the chunker is what we call the 40 millimeter give the chunker a shot so knowing from my infantry stuff when you shoot a machine gun um you have to give it at least a five to seven round burst or the gun will jam. Right. So same thing. I, I thought the same thing with the chunker. So I pulled that trigger. <laughs> and I don't hear anything. And uh, I, I say I don't hear anything. I don't feel anything. And you just hear this. Tuk, 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 tuk. And then uh, you go, whoa, 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 whoa. And I release the trigger, look up, and it's just a bunch of little black dots headed off in the sky. And uh, I must have shot 50 grenades, high explosive grenades in the first burst and he's going wow because most people save their rounds <laughs> on the first shot uh, so yeah for the next 30 seconds we were watching the grenades explode as they're landing down range so yeah that was a blast i'm glad i treated the cobra i say treated it it felt like flying the p51 mustang really it was like the old school so to speak the front seat of the cobra was kind of like the viper it sits canned back it's got a side stick, uh, joy, uh, cyclic on the side, uh, on the right really? hand. Yeah, with your, um, it's got a little arm pad and a little side stick, just like the Viper. Yeah. And then the, uh, the collective on the left side is also, it's almost vertical. So you're pulling it back to bring in more power, so to speak, uh, instead of lifting it up like you do oh, on wow. the. Wow, so that's. Uh, yeah, no. that's tough. Oh, and the, the air, it would say um, a mesh seat. So the air conditioner blows through the seat onto your uh, into you, so to speak. say it blows through the seat. Um, so yeah, that thing was oh. a blast. Wow, wow. So did you deploy with it? No, and I say thankfully not. The Cobra was great for its day, and I was like say it's like the P fifty one Mustang. It was great for its day, but try to put a P fifty one against a, a Viper or a Hornet, it ain't gonna happen. And that was the great thing about the Apache was the army and um, McDonald, Douglas, Bell, whoever, we learned everything bad about the Cobra and fixed it in the Apache. Um, everything bad about the Cobra, uh, you know, two engines, the semi, we call it semi ridiculous teetering rotor system, but the semi rigid uh, teetering rotor, it's the same thing as the Robbie. Uh, so you can't go negative G's in the Cobra. You, you get mass bumping. Oh yeah, you, you, well you get two bumps. The, the first will be a bump, the second will knock it off. Um, and then uh, the crash worthiness of the Cobra 
was all fixed in the, uh, I'll say the lack of crashworthiness of the Cobra was fixed in the Apache helicopter with uh, crash attenuating seats, uh, the landing gear, even though the Cobra had the skids that would spread, but it wasn't much. Um, and if you look at a Cobra, normally if the Cobra had a really hard vertical impact landing, uh, the front seater would eat the telescopic sight units with uh, the sight system that we looked through. Yeah. It would go through their face, then the blades would flex down, knock their head off, and then uh, the, the gun turret would uh, would pretty much shove right up through the seat. So you got it from all different directions in the Cobra. Oh, God. Uh, that's... The Apache was fixed on that. And that was the other thing. The, uh, the original Cobra that I flew in flight school had the 20 millimeter three barrel uh, gun. It was never designed for that. And I say this because we could roll in a uh, fixed gun um, on a diving run with the 20 millimeter at about 120 knots, pull the trigger, and it would slow the helicopter down to about 100 knots by the time you pulled out of your uh, dive. Oh, so, wow. uh, yeah, it really shook the helicopter. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, wow. so it was, the Cobra was fun. <laughs> a so lot of fun, but I wouldn't want to take it into combat. How many hours did you end up flying it? Oh, not even, what, about 250 hours in the Cobra. Oh, so it's a short, pretty short oh, time. Yeah. And, and you transitioned to the A-model Apache? Yes, the A-model Apache in, uh, what was it, uh, 1992 to 93. And oh, so uh, you just missed Gulf War One. I. I was, uh, and I explained that in the book, I was actually in flight school. I took my first ride in the Huey on uh, the day that uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. And uh, so right after that, where flight school was basically Monday through Friday, nine to five, um, from that point on, everybody was geared to go to the desert. And flight school then was seven days a week. And uh, yeah, there was guys from the Vietnam era that were riding on the bus with us out to the, the airfield to get back up into the, uh, the Cobra and the Apache. Uh, they were going to war. The, uh, the Flying Tigers who were based there in Fort Rucker, I watched them as they deployed uh, saying goodbye to their families and everything right outside our barracks there at, uh, wow. at Port Rucker. So, yeah, I missed out on that, uh, good or bad. Uh, yeah, missed out on that. Jeez. So you continued in the in the uh, the guard in the uh, A model. So uh, now we're talking 90s, the Clinton era, into the the late 90s. So I guess your next deployment's Afghanistan, or did you guys do any uh, Bosnia? <laughs> No, we didn't do Bosnia. We did um, actually, so I had my crash in the Apache in 1994. Uh, oh, no, that's right. Let's talk about that. Yeah, 1995. Um, it was, uh, I write about it in the book, but it was um, a normal training sortie at night. Um, I was working full time for a, uh, a refinery down in South Houston. Uh, left work. Drove up to Conroe, got in the helicopter. We found out myself and my uh, my stick buddies, what we call them, Tommy. Uh, we found out that we had to fly at least five hours in night vision system that night to get ready for gunnery uh, at the end of the month. And uh, so we went out and flew, uh, came back uh, to the Conroe airport. At that time, there was no tower. So um, totally uncontrolled airport. There were several other, and we still had OH-58s. Um, they were not Kiowa Warriors but they were uh, just the regular jet rangers. And, uh, and I say this because they were in the pattern also with us. Okay. Um, and I was on uh, downwind for right downwind to land on runway, runway one four. And um, as I was just about to uh, turn uh, downwind to base leg, a Learjet calls out that he's four miles out on the uh, localizer or the ILS for runway 14. And uh, we could not see really above a thousand feet because it was a real thin layer of clouds that had built up. And um, so you, you could look straight up and see the stars, but you couldn't look horizontally and see anything. Um, so Tommy, who was the pilot in command flying from the back, from the back seat, calls on the radio asking, hey Learjet, do you see us and all? And I'm slowing down and turning on my right base and um, the Learjet never called back. And uh, I'm thinking, oh man. Um, so he's four miles out at probably 100, repping at what, 120? Um, 
and here I am slowing down to about 70 knots, and uh, and I'm like, well, less than half a mile from the runway, and I'm thinking, yeah, this guy's going to catch up to us pretty quick. So started slowing down and coming down, and then uh, Tommy called him again, and they never answered, and he's like, I have the controls. So he took the controls of the helicopter right at about eh, 20 feet above the runway. We turned to the right, going at about 20 knots, and I say turn to the right, about 45 degree turn to the right to get off the runway. And uh, and I'm looking back to the left, um, thinking this, this Learjet is fixing to land right behind us as we get off the runway. And that's pretty much all I remember. Um, it was, um, the next thing I remember was, I'm all the way leaning forward up against the fire control panel on the left side of the our sighting system. And, um, I'm thinking, wow, this is weird. Why is why am I leaning all the way forward? And and I could feel we were still flying. I still feel the helicopter rocking around. And I thought, oh shoot, stay away from the controls. You know, I don't I don't know what's going on. But um, and then uh, I remember grabbing the two grips that have all the switches to aim and look and shoot weapons and stuff like that. And um, and I remember seeing a. Uh, uh, a green aura illuminating everything, a green light, and then the master caution light comes on with the low rotor RPM uh, master warning light on, and I'm thinking, oh shoot, um, shit, you know, we're, we've got a low rotor, and, uh, and I don't know if I told Tommy, I, I was going like, hey, you know, I think I told him, hey, we got a low rotor RPM. Uh, next thing I remember, we're, uh, remember getting slammed left and right and uh, and I say when I, I don't, it's like somebody stopped the video, mm -hmm. and then starts the starts my movie again, so to speak. And uh, and now I'm getting shaken side to side, you know, a little bit. I'm thinking, wow, this is weird. Um, and now I'm thinking, well, shoot, I must be at home. I must be asleep, and eh, you know, whatever. Uh, where did I park my jeep? Um, and then uh, and it's like somebody cuts the movie off again, and I'm like. Uh, it comes back on. Now, this time I'm shaking really, 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 really hard uh, left to right. I'm like, oh, shoot. Okay. Well, I guess I'm, I'm having a nightmare and my wife will wake me up any second now. And, and where did I park my Jeep? And uh, uh, yeah, and then somebody cuts the video off again, starts up again. Now, this time I'm getting slammed back and forth, left and right, I should say. Uh, just get slammed really, really hard. Um, and it's just going on, it seems like forever. And I'm thinking, oh my God, this hurts. And is this ever going to stop? And I'm thinking, oh my God, we're crashing. And I don't know if I did or not, but I thought I got to get my head down and low to the left so the blades don't come through the, the cockpit and take my head off. Shoot, next thing I remember is, uh, I remember the um, looking up through the canopy and uh, the, the canopy's all spiderweb cracked. And I could see the stars. I'm thinking, like, wow, this is weird. And then I remember looking up to the right, and um, it was Tommy, but I didn't know who it was. It was just this figure standing, looking down at me um, from the side of the helicopter. Now, I say this because the Apache, oh, my God, it sits, you know, six feet above the ground, where normally if somebody was standing there, I'd be looking down at him as opposed to looking up at him. And uh, he's, uh, he's uh, saying, you know, something – Sounds like Charlie Brown's teacher. He's going wah 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 wah. I'm thinking like, who the hell are you? And what are you what are you saying? Um, and then somebody just like cuts off the video, starts it up again. And this time, I'm halfway out of the cockpit through the broken canopy on the side, and my hands are in the ground. Uh, I'm in the push-up position, you know, trying to crawl out of the front seat. And um, um, and then I remember there's two feet standing next to my head. I'm thinking. Ah, crap, I'm caught. Uh, oh, man, you know, who caught me or whatever. Invasion. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and so, and it was Tommy. Uh, he grabs me underneath my uh, shoulder or underneath my armpits and lifts me up. And that's when I'm like, oh, man, it hurt like hell. I mean, it really, really hurt bad. Um, and I remember looking at him thinking, what the hell happened? And he's like, wah, 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 wah. He was saying something. And, uh, what he told me later was that he said, like, hey, we crashed. I don't know how long we've been here, um, but nobody's coming to get us. 
And uh, and this is a, right in the middle of the airfield there at Conroe. No tower, no lights. Uh, and he says, we're going to have to walk back to the hangar, which is about probably close to a mile away. And uh, I don't remember any of this. He's just saying that, yeah, we started walking. He said, he goes, we got to walk to the hangar. And I said, all right. And then I just turned in this direction and started walking away. And he's going, no, 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 no. You got to walk this way. Um, so he knew that I was, um, got the living hell shaken out of me. I wasn't there, so to speak. And uh, he was an EMS pilot at the time. So he thought like, oh, man, I was complaining so much about my right side um, that he thought I had internal injuries and bleeding. Um, so we walked back to the, walked back to the hangar and I don't know, uh, the, um, I remember a, a tractor came pulling up to us, one of our tractors that pulls the helicopters in. I remember he pulls up to us. I think like, all right, we're going to get a ride back. And, uh, and I remember they're talking, wah, 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 wah. And then he takes off and they got, like, God dang it. <laughs> we got to continue walking. Um, and then I remember seeing everybody from, you know, all the other pilots running down the taxiway at us. I'm like, oh man. Um, and wow. then, uh, held my, you know, a really good friend of mine that actually lost his life a couple of years after, uh, was holding me up and, um, everybody's trying to get me to lay down. The ambulances are on the way. And I heard somebody say like, life light helicopter is required to be called on this. And I'm thinking, dang it, I don't have a resume. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but man, I was hurting. Um, and what ended up happening was uh, I had busted out the right canopy with my head um, and I had hit my, up underneath my ribs, the armor plating on the sides of the seat had actually uh, dug up and basically spread my ribs um that's what the doctor told me so yeah i god i can't even imagine cracking or breaking ribs because wow that hurts um what caused the crash was the um at that time it was called um uh, well the, the hornet's got in the viper the hars system heading attitude reference system mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it's a computer that's got gyros in it that pretty much tells the autopilot and uh, and all what attitude, airspeed, and everything else the helicopter's in. So it, it had what was called a HARS spike with a DASEC failure. Uh, the HARS system, Dash 14 software is a big, long number, but Dash 14 was the last number. That software was building up uh, memory in the RAMs, in the random memory, and occasionally it would spit it out. It would spike it out, HARS spike. Um, whatever control input it spit out is what the helicopter did uh, through the DASEC, the Digital Automatic Stabilization Computer. Oh, um, so on, on our deal, um, Tommy said the helicopter, it's like somebody stomped the right pedal, and so the nose, you know, yawed hard to the right, about 60 degrees, is like, whoa. And um, then he brought it back to the front. We, he said we were about 15 feet off the ground, moving along at about 10 knots. And then... Um, so he thought, wow, that's weird. And then he said, all of a sudden, boom, it kicks to the left about 60 degrees. He's like, whoa, there's something's wrong here. And uh, so he strains it out again, and uh, he's still moving forward. And all of a sudden, he said it, it kicked hard, very hard to the right, so much so that it bled the main rotor. The engines couldn't keep up with the, the uh, power demand of the tail rotor. And so that's where he ended up turning and uh, the tail hit the ground. It tweaked the tail boom um, enough that the tail rotor stopped. But then it ended up still turning and, and basically crashing on the ground. Uh, so wow. that was, yeah, all of about, they said they figured all of that took place in about three seconds. And uh, yeah, so there you go. $18 million in three seconds. <laughs> and which, uh, which way does the rotor, is it American? Yeah, it's American. Okay. Yeah. So, which was kind of odd because it it turned to the left, sort of with the rotor, um, mm -hmm. as it was crashing. It was hitting the ground. Let's say hitting the ground. The the blades were smacking the ground on the right side, which was actually, I say, most likely saved my life because um, they were on their they were they hit the ground first to the right, and then they were on their upswing. 
it still hit the canopy, but it hit the top of the canopy. But by the wow. time the blades went around, uh, after hitting the ground and hitting the canopy, they, I would say disintegrated, but they came apart enough that the next hits were below me on the side of the helicopter. And um, the um, my head, like I said, I flexed over so hard on the um, to the right that I busted the canopy out with my head, with my helmet. Um, and then the blades hitting the ground knocked up dirt so hard that I had dirt that came up underneath my helmet all the way to the back of my head, underneath the helmet. Uh, I had a huge, obviously a wow. big uh, bruise on my forehead and, uh, and, and a scrape from the dirt. <laughs> so um, wow. the green light that was illuminating everything was my lip light. Have you, has Lester, well, do y'all use lip lights in uh, the Hornets in the, or the Vipers? In the military we do. We've got lip lights yeah. that, to the mask, so yeah. at nighttime. It, it, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, so the same thing. Mine, it had actually ripped off. Um, the, what do you call it, the, um, uh, the battery pack, we never found that. We never found my flashlight. Um, crap went everywhere. Uh, they used one. One of the guys said that they never used like ten rolls of that engineer tape to surround the crash site because stuff went everywhere. I mean, literally hundreds of feet away. There was missiles. There were uh, oh octopods, tail boom, all sorts of stuff was everywhere. So there you go. Uh, and I've been fine ever since then. You know, I'm fine wow. and life's going good. Jeez. <laughs> so were you flying at the time on your civilian job? You said you were working at the refinery. Were you, was, did no, you have at a... that time, um, I was, so this was 1993 until um, 99. I was working for Arco Pipeline Company. Um, okay. But I was also getting my fixed wing ratings, finishing them up at the school so that I could get on with the airlines. Uh, oh, wow. So that was the only other flying I was doing at that time was airplane flying. How long were you out of flying for after the mishap? It was about, yeah, because uh, we were, that was uh, March, three months. Oh, that's not too bad. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> not, I mean, what were your, what were, the, what were the extent of your actual injuries? I mean, long term, was it anything that like gave you problems or was it just you yeah. healed up and you're back to flying? No, you know, it, you know, when you're, when you're young and flying the, uh, an attack helicopter, uh, there's nothing that's going to stop you. Um, yeah. So other than the bruising, and basically as the doc said, it's kind of like the shaken baby syndrome. It literally just rattled my brain and everything else. And actually, actually my neck is um, a bulging disc and stuff since then. Um, I thought nothing of it. But when I went back flying in June, it was at Fort Hood, and obviously I had to fly with the senior instructor pilot. Um, during the day, life was fine, it was good. Uh, but when we got flying at night, that's when I realized a lot of things. Uh, one, how good we were before the crash. And I say this because, I mean, we were, uh, geez, we were doing, you know, 120, 130, about 50 feet off the ground at night under night vision system only, uh, you know, nap of the earth. Uh, and. Uh, and I just remember thinking, like, wow, this is not, wow, this is holy mackerel. Uh, you grab the, you know, the towel racks and go like, oh, shit, you know, this is bullshit. Uh, but I thought, well, okay, yeah, it's going to take a little bit of, um, you're going to be a little gun shy. Um, and I basically I powered through it is what I did. Uh, got the job with customs. Um, didn't think much of it either until we were based out of Aruba. Um a day off down there, another guy, another pilot said, hey, let's go into this submarine um, right there off the coast of Aruba. It's a, uh, a tourist submarine. I thought, like, wow, that sounds cool. Um, we went out on the boat, and, and I say boat, you know, a 30-footer little um, people boat, takes us out to the little submarine, and um, we're getting, <laughs> we're getting, people are going down the stairs to it, and I'm like, ooh, hang on a second. I peek down in there and like everybody is scrunched up, lined up, you know, probably about 10 people per side, all scrunched up looking down and looking at me, I'm thinking like, ooh, no, this is, 
Uh, and so I, I turn around, I get back up the stairs, and uh, the guy says, hey, uh, we're fixing to go. you got to get in there. I'm like, nope, I'm not going. He's going like, well, the boat's gone. And I'm like, I guess I'm swimming. And he goes, uh, well, I get, you can stay on a uh, the, the tender that takes the sub out there. Uh, and it's only, it was only like five miles offshore. And um, uh, I'm thinking, okay, I can do that, man. And he goes, okay, let him bring it up. And I, man, I run down and I jump <laughs> jump onto the tender and he's going, okay, I guess you're, that's where you're going. And, um, uh, so I'm sitting there, sub goes underwater and, uh, the captain goes like, uh, you know, what's the problem? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I, all of a sudden that was the weirdest feeling I've ever had. I was like, I didn't want to get in that little tube with all those people. And all these were like, yeah, I see it all the time. I'm like, really? He's going like, yeah, he goes, it's mainly, um, middle-aged to older people. Uh, he goes, because, uh, kids, they want to do it. And, uh, grandparents, they don't care anymore. They go down there in, with them. And he says, but it's the middle-aged men that have something to lose. And they lost control getting inside that, that submarine. They're the ones that, uh, have anxiety attacks. And, uh, he says, you're not the first one that's ridden with me on the boat, yeah. <laughs> so to speak. So, and even then I didn't think much of it. And it wasn't until combat that, um, yeah, it, it kind of finally came through like, oh, wow, this is not right. <laughs> uh, but really? Then again, like a lot what, of what, what kind of, this is not right, like anxiety? Yeah. Yeah. All of a sudden, I did not want to get in the helicopter anymore. All of a sudden, um, it was uh, it was cramped. Uh, it was cramped, uh, claustrophobic. I mean, it was just like, holy mackerel. It's, it's no kidding. It's, kidding. Yeah. It was just, but, and I say this cause I talked to, you know, flight surgeon while I was there and, and he got in the, uh, the, I think he just wanted to get in the Apache, but you know, he says, well, let me see what this thing's like. He got in, he's going, yeah, this thing's pretty small. Uh, and I'm thinking like, man, but it's never been, you know, I, yes. at that time I had what, 1500 hours in the airframe and, uh, it never bothered me before. Um, so, but now then again, we were, we were deep, deep into a lot of shooting, uh, in Afghanistan and we just lost our Chinook, you know, with 10 people on it. Um, yeah, there was a, yeah. So everything was basically piling up yeah. and, um, yeah. So how'd yeah. you deal with it? How'd you get through it? I had to power through it. Um, yeah. we did not, we did not have enough pilots, um, for me to say like, you know what? And I could have, I could have said, Hey, yeah, this is not for me anymore. I'm, I'm, I'm out of here. Um, wow. so I just, he said he could give me some drugs. And this is a flight surgeon. He said, I can give you some medicine. I'm thinking like, dude, I'm, I'm a pilot. I can't be taking that stuff. He's going, I don't think so. <laughs> I can give it to you though. And I'm like, ah, this, that's not right. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, so, so um, it was that, it was that, claustrophobic, I don't want to be here anymore feeling in the aircraft. Yeah. 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 All of a sudden it was, um, yeah, yeah. Basically what you said, you just want out. You want you like, I don't care where I am right now. I, I want well, to be not in this seat. Yeah. Uh, the first like real, I'm like, yeah, no shit. Real, uh, claustrophobic attack was when I got back from my R and R my uh, mid tour break. Um, even before I went on my mid tour break, we had just lost that Chinook. Um, and so we were, we, everybody was dealing with that. And then I was dealing with it to the point of like, you know what, maybe I really don't, cause I did not want to get, um, in that C 17 and take the long flight back to Kuwait and then the long flight back home and all that sort of stuff. So I was saying, you know, maybe I don't want to go home. Um, I'll just stay here. But um, the doc said, yeah, I can give you some medicine to get home on. And he never did. But I said, okay. And he never did. Uh, when I got back, we did an, um, a real, I say real, um, a deliberate attack to get a high-value target. And um, we were, um, on my first flight back, anybody that went on R&R, &R, even though the R&R &R, uh, was 15 days, you're actually out of the cockpit for almost a month. You know, you're, you're like five days before you got to get all prepped and then get over to 
Kuwait and all that. And then it takes you, oh, good God, maybe a week or two to even get back in country. So your first flight back is with a um, uh, our senior instructor pilot again, and uh, which is fine, and I have no problems with that. Um, and so we're roasting across the desert, um, daytime, and uh, and all of a sudden it was like, yeah, that that oh, wow, it's like I had an instant 110 degree fever. Yep. Um, started getting really hot in the head, and then I'm thinking, wow, man, I'm like really sweating. I don't want to be here. Um, Yep. You know, this, this is bullshit. And uh, so I ended up, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, literally. Uh, so I told him, hey, you have the controls. Um, and uh, he said, why? And I'm like, I, I got a hot spot in my helmet. So I took my helmet off. And, uh, and you know, with the body armor and mm -hmm. all, the, you know, all that sort of stuff, it's like, good God. So I'm, I'm trying to undo the seatbelt, uh, you know, loosen up the straps and trying to pull the, uh, my flight suit out, you know, to get some air conditioning in there. Cause man, I was just sweating like crazy. Um, and I think, man, I just, I mean, it almost got to the point where I was like, you know what, let's just land and I'll walk back in the yeah. Afghan desert back to Bagram. Um, so I sat there for probably, it felt like forever, but maybe, maybe a minute. Yeah. You know, I'm kind of buttoned everything back up and I said, okay, yeah, it was a hot spot. And he's going like, yeah, he knew, uh, he told me later, he said, like, yeah, I could hear you breathing over the sound <laughs> of the helicopter from the back seat, uh, not on the ICS either. And uh, shit. Yeah, so he knew, yeah, he knew I was uh, uh, having issues. Um, wow. So, yeah, that, yeah. Well, that that is absolutely fascinating, and I, I want to table that for now because yep. I, I'd really like to invite you. I'm going to do another uh, video or special with some other pilots and talk about mental health because I think that's very important in this community yeah. and we don't talk about stuff like this enough so let's table that and promise me you'll come back and we'll talk about that some more because that is absolutely critical I think people need to hear yeah. about it but let's go back yeah. that stuff aside um, we'll talk about your your deployments and then we'll come back to customs so tell me about you know going to war in the Apache Wow Okay, so I knew uh, I knew we were I knew I was going to be going to war after we invaded Iraq. I thought, okay, this this is going to happen. Um, I ended up getting LASIK because I finally had to wear glasses, and I thought there's no way in the world I'm going to go uh, to the desert uh, uh, with contacts or glasses. So I ended up getting LASIK. Kind of the army said like, no, you can't do that right now. This is 2003, and um, I said, oh yeah, I can. I'm in the reserves, and I can just get out if I want. Yeah, and, I do uh, what I want. Fuba yeah. jar. <laughs> and, uh, so by the, the the doc goes like, okay, well make sure you use a you know a reputable eye surgeon to do it, which I did. Um, got that done, and then you know just started. Uh, it's like wow, this is really happening. Um, I did not know at first whether we were going to Iraq or Afghanistan. That was a a big deal because. There was some fighting and a lot of very vicious fighting was going on in Iraq at the time. And mm -hmm. several Apaches got knocked out of the sky along with Hawks and all the other ones. And, you know, uh, it was it was the real deal there in Iraq. And I was like, man, I don't know about going there. Um, and then I say, thankfully, uh, they said, you're going to Afghanistan. I'm like, eh. so I did a lot of research on that. Like, you know what? I love snowboarding. <laughs> I'm going to try to find a way to take my snowboard with me. And then. Uh, um, we mobilized at Fort Hood, Texas. Um, the army was still so far behind on their mobilization stuff that we were doing all ground gate guard stuff, uh, convoy where I would be driving in a convoy, not flying. There was no flying trait, no flight training whatsoever, uh, in mobilization. Wow. Yeah. It really, really, really yeah. sucked. Um, we ended up, uh, Actually, at that time, Fort Hood was having a, a really bad uh, wildfires downrange, so we had to go to our, our gunnery uh, up in Idaho, out of uh, Mountain Home, Idaho. Um, and that yeah. was pretty cool. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and uh, yeah, saw so, all the little gophers or moles, whatever those things are out there. That was actually prairie dogs. That's what they were. Uh, Love shooting those with the uh, the thirty millimeter. But anyway, so we got to go shoot out there and. Uh, Came back and then uh, we uh, 
got on the, uh, went back, to, got our Christmas break, went skiing, snowboarding uh, over Christmas with the family. And then uh, basically, um, yeah, this was it. You know, we were fixing to go. I was fixing to go back to Fort Hood for the last time in, in January after the Christmas break. And, uh, and I was sitting there uh, filling out wills and uh, powers of attorneys and all the paper, bloody paperwork you got to fill out uh, right here at the house. Um, and I was overlooking my back patio with my pond and my daughter Shelby, that was 10 at the time, she was back there looking at our koi fish and all that, feeding them. And I thought, you know, screw this. Um, put the paperwork, put the pen down, went out back, stood there at the back patio, looking out at her and she didn't know I was there. And so I just go, hey, Shelby, what do you think about what do you think about me going to, to war? She didn't turn around. She just stopped what she was doing and just looked straight ahead and said, like, Dad, and she, she, she raised her hand. She goes, Dad, you're the best at what you do, and I know God's going to take care of you, so wow. I'm not worried at all. And uh, I thought, holy mackerel. Okay. <laughs> so I turned around and went back inside because, you know, how do you follow that up? And uh, so I ended up talking to her later, and my son, Eric, same thing. Uh, and I wrote all about that in the book, but uh, – yeah, that was kind of when I realized this is it. We're going. And there was no news about Afghanistan at the time. Everything was in Iraq. Everything in the news was about Iraq. So just a little bit of news I could get from Afghanistan, I thought it was going to be, I mean, it's going to be a, a cakewalk. Uh, and it's going to be a beautiful country, uh, which it is when they're not shooting at you. And they had, um, uh, we, Went back to Fort Hood, and a month later, they got us on the bus, went there to the uh, airfield, and got on the big jet and flew on over there. Um, and then it was about, what was it called? Uh, Kyrgyzstan, Bishkek is where we went. Um, yeah, that place is just cold. Seriously cold. <laughs> seriously, seriously cold. Wow. Um, stayed there for a week and then got our uh, C-17 into Bagram and... Uh, there you go. We're in the airfield and life's good. First two weeks, nothing but classes, getting acclimated to the time zone, all that sort of stuff. And then we uh, started off doing ring routes, which was basically following um, Chinooks and Blackhawks as they delivered parts, troops, bullets, whatever you want to call it, to all the different Ford operating bases. FOBs is what we called them. Um, yeah, we just followed them around uh, for the first couple of weeks. And then our first guy got hit. Uh, in what we would find out later was the Korangal Valley, um, where Operation Red Wings happened, where uh, Lone Survivor, the movie, mm -hmm. it happened right there. Um, and actually, it happened six months prior. We were briefed on that mission uh, in February uh, about Red Wings and all. But all they told us was that, yeah, there was a, a major operation last summer, Red Wing, and uh, uh, Navy... SEAL recce team had uh, been compromised, and that's where you know the Chinook went in to get them, was knocked out of the sky, killing everybody, and, uh, and that's it. That's all they told us. Um, so little Davey, he ended up, uh, they were flying in the Vec, the Korangal and the Shiriak Valleys were two valleys side by side. Uh, the ridge line in between those two valleys is where actually where the, the SEAL team was compromised. Um, they were supporting an attack at the entrance of the Shiriak, and the ground commander told them, hey, move out of here because every time um, you Apaches show up, the bad guys go into caves, and then they can't find them. So he moved over about, what, maybe about four or five miles to the entrance of the Korngal Valley, and uh, he was circling really low, and somebody stitched that helicopter from nose to tail, just uh, AK-47, literally hit everything from the nose to the tail. Uh, one of the bullets came through the canopy and hit him right here, uh, oh little baby in the back seat. And uh, in the movie, uh, you can see on the canopy, it's a little clear square patch with a round hole in it. That's the bullet hole that actually went through. They didn't change that canopy for several months. Um, but unbelievably, his survival knife was right here. And it hit the handle and broke the handle, bounced around inside the cockpit. Uh, other than changing his underwear, he was fine. And uh, you say the and, movie. Remind remind everybody the movie. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. So everything I'm saying, I filmed. 
uh, I'll say everything, pretty much everything that I did in Afghanistan, I filmed and let's see how you do this. No. <laughs> Tilt. There you go. Yeah. No. Um, it's on Amazon Prime right now. And uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Netflix and Voodoo and some of the other places. But that's it right there. Um, I filmed uh, 25 hours of my own videos and gigabytes of pictures that I took. Um, and so that's what we use in that, that movie there, uh, describing these movies. But after that first shot, um, wow. Uh, then all of us were getting in fights, not with each other, but with the Taliban, easily once a week. And then the next month, it was easily two to two fights a week, maybe three. And then it just ramped up in the summer. And man, pretty much every day of the week, we were getting in battles. Uh, and I was up in the northeast sector, so up near Bagram, um, Jalalabad, j is what we called it, and that's where they launched to go get uh, Osama bin Laden. They launched out of j there. Um, I was based there a couple of months. The other place was uh, Salerno, or coast, uh, is what that place was. Uh, and every place up north from the Hindu, or the Khyber Pass up north, um, into what was, you know, then the Korangal Valley, which was, uh, well, as we found out, the most hotly contested valley in all of Afghanistan at that time, way more than even down in Helmand, a province, you know, down to the south near Kandahar. Uh, the Korangal Valley, you knew going in there that you were going to get shot at going in. You were going to get shot at while you were in there, and you were going to get shot at leaving. Plain and simple, you were going to get shot at in the Korangal Valley. Um, a lot of my shootings happened in the Korngal. Uh, a lot of very um, intense battles, day and night, uh, were there in the Korngal. I wrote about them all in the book. Um, the, I wouldn't say the first guy that I killed, but yeah, my, yeah the first guy I killed was there in the Korngal, uh, leaving it. Several months later, um, I actually saw, well, it was a whole bunch of them that uh, were shooting at it, shooting at the Chinook that I was escorting uh, and I ended up shooting. And that's the best thing about the Apache. Uh, Caswell kind of said it too. We wear that helmet display unit, that eyepiece, which is basically a heads up display uh, over our right eye. And wherever we look, it shoots, controls the gun, you know, the 30 millimeter uh, bullet uh, from the Apache. We shoot 10 round burst. Each bullet is a high explosive dual purpose round, which means it, uh, uh, it'll punch through about, uh, what is it, four inches of steel. And it's got a five meter kill radius like a grenade. So oh, um, cool. they were, I was following a Chinook coming out of the, the south end of the Korngal. Um, so we had to go from 6,000 feet to 12,000 feet in about a mile and a half, maybe, no, maybe a mile. Um, the sun was already up. We'd already done the route once before. The Chinook would land in the Korngal outpost. Uh, offload new troops, unload old troops. And then they would, on this day, we were going to fly out of there to the south. It's a box canyon that the entrance is on the north side or coming in from the north, and it's a box canyon to the south end. And uh, doing this for the previous couple of weeks, months, we were always getting shot at going in and out. So uh, the commander that day said, we're going out the south end. And I'm like, dude, we don't have the power we don't have the power, uh, especially once the sun really starts coming up. Um, we don't have the power to get out the, the south end. Um, he kind of said, like, yeah, we do, and that's what we're going to do. The Chinook pilot was going, like, I guess we'll show him that we can't do this. I'm like, stop. <laughs> what do you mean we're going to show him we can't do this? <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad plan. That um, sounds very military, yes. Yeah, yeah it makes sense. Yeah. Uh, things are happening too fast. We don't have time to make smart decisions is basically what they're saying. Yeah. Um, so we made it the first run on the way out. I we were barely going to clear the saddle. Um, and on the right side of the saddle was a rock face. And um, so as we're trying to climb out, um, I asked the Chinook guy, I said, hey, man, I'm going to pull up next to you. And I'm going to fire a couple of white phosphorus ra rockets into the ridge line because we're going to be climbing just barely over the treetops. And um, that's a perfect place to get ambushed. So he said, yeah, man, do it. So shot off a couple of Willie P on it. And everybody's like, oh, wow, cool. Uh, we go off the <laughs> other side. 
go down to uh, Abad, uh, Sadabad, reload some more troops, come in the north end. And now this time the sun's already up uh, big time. And uh, as we're heading out the south end this time, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm going to uh, I'm going to hug that rock wall and try to catch some thermals to help me get over that ridge line. And uh, so I'm maybe 50 meters from that rock wall. The Chinook is um, he's about maybe 50 meters in front of me, maybe 100 meters in front of me. And um, his tailgate is down. And I just have you know this. So his yeah, tailgate is down. There you go. And there's a, a door gunner on the back that's sitting there um, manning a gun. So I'm following him, like I said, maybe, let's call it 75 meters. And uh, I'm hugging the rock wall to try to catch the thermals to help me get over. And uh, and I look at the back of the, the Chinook and I'm just about to tell my co-pilot lieutenant, I'm like, dude, this is really bad. I have no place to go. I have no more power. Um, I can't obviously go to the right. I can barely make it out the left because we're kind of going up a ravine. And um, yeah, we're, we're stuck. And sure enough, then I start seeing smoke coming off the back end of the Chinook. I'm like, ooh, wow. Uh, just about to squeeze the, the radio button to tell them, hey, man, you've got problems. There's smoke coming off the back end. And then I see red laser beams coming off. And this is daytime. Red laser beams coming off the back of the Chinook to that rock wall. And I'm thinking, what the heck? Now look over there to the right. And sure enough, there's like a group of 10 fighters at least. And everybody's shooting at that Chinook, and the Chinook shooting back, the tail gunner is. At the same time, I'm like, holy crap. And so I'm between the Chinook and the rock wall. Oh, uh, and so I see them right about the time they see me. And it's kind of, I say it's funny now, it wasn't then. And they're all hammering away at that at the, um, at the Chinook. And then they turn and they look at me like, <laughs> Habib. <laughs> And uh, they all swing their guns at me. I'm thinking, like, oh, man, sweet baby Jesus, here we go. So that's the great thing about the Apache is I flip the weapon action switch, the WAS switch. Uh, move it up. The gun's active. I look. I fire off a 10-round burst right at them as they're firing right back at me. And um, that's where I say I saw the, the first guy I hit um, pretty much hit him center mass. And I just remember seeing the top part of his body pop through the air. Uh, everything else is kind of covered in the the black smoke dust that the uh, the rounds exploding around them. Um, so the first burst was going with me. Um, so they landed to the left side of the group for the most part. Uh, squeezed the rounds again this time center mat or a little bit to the right of them so the so the bullets would follow me and hit them. Uh, right about that time he fires a uh, and there he. You know, it's like the movies have it really good. Um, you see the flash, you see the puff of smoke, and then uh, here comes the RPG. Um, it's coming, and I don't know if I can show this. As we're climbing, it he fired in front of me. He led me perfect. Um, so it's I'm watching it coming at me, and uh, right, it would have hit center mass, but it went right underneath me. I looked off to the left, and boom, there was a, an air explosive uh, RPG. And I'm like, oh, shit, you know, RPG left. And um, shoot at him again with the gun, and then squeeze the trigger, squeeze the trigger as I'm going by them, um, and nothing's coming out. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, <laughs> the gun's not working. I'm, I'm squeezing the trigger. Um, we get right over the top of the ridge line, and um, my lieutenant's going like, well, he was having a full-on helmet fire. Um, he's going, where, where, where? And he'd taken the gun away from me. So with the Apache, if I select the gun, I control it and shoot it. But if the other guy selects the gun, well, now he's got it. And, well, I can take it right back again. And we can go back and forth. You know, final deal is I can actually hit master arm override and just keep it as the pilot in command. Um, he had taken the gun, but he didn't know what we were shooting at. He was like, and I was like, ah. so we go off the, you know, the backside and we're flying, you know, zorching out of the sky. And uh, the Chinook says, yeah, we, we've got some injured inside. And I'm like, God dang it. You know, and 
So I'm telling, you know, the LT, like, dude, don't ever take the gun. If you don't know what you're shooting at, don't take the gun. Oh, man, it was everything I could do to. So you're in the back seat this whole time? This, like, yeah. your pilot I'm, command the pilot in the back command, seat? Yeah, the pilot command's in the back. Um, and you have a better feel for the helicopter because you're closer to the, the mast. And so you're closer to the center of lift of the helicopter. If you're sitting up front, uh, if you have any kind of yaw, it's uh, very prominent in the front. Um, if you're in the back seat, you're closer to the center lift. Um, you can only be off a little bit on yaw, and it doesn't. You know, you'll know it in the front seat. You got to be way off to say, "I go, wow, yeah, we're really out of trim." Um, same thing with the pitching and, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I uh, we landed and oh god, the we landed at Abad. Uh, I'm watching the um, medics come out, take the wounded off the back of the Chinook. I'm like, God dang it, man. We just, uh, you know, just had a bunch of guys shot up inside the Chinook and uh, shut everything down. Uh, the Chinook took around in the, um, I don't know if you can see this, but right at the blade cuff, um, took around right there. And I say around, it was, uh, we're most, it was most likely a, uh, a PKM round, a 51 caliber round, um, not PKM, uh, yeah, a 51 caliber round, because it had left a huge divot in the uh, in the cuff, and so then they had, uh, engineers had to get out there and take pictures and everything, because they didn't know if it had spalled inside, you know, done damage inside the cuff that we couldn't mm-hmm. see, um, so they said, okay, I mean, we're talking hours later. We're talking oh, hours later. Um, they said, okay, they cleared us to fly back to Bagram. Man, what, about 100 and, 150 miles away. Um, I'm like, okay, no problem. Um, so I'm following them. But shortly into the flight, they say, like, I'm going, hey, guys, we're we're clear. Let's speed this up. Uh, we're barely doing 40 knots. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, and... Uh, they go like, yeah, the engineer said we have to stay below 100 feet and below 60 knots, I think is what he said, uh, because if we start hearing or feeling anything wrong, we got to get on the ground now. And I'm like, ooh, ooh, uh, 150 miles at, say, 50, 60 knots, um, the it's Apache burns. Yeah, we don't have enough gas. Um, yeah, we were. I was on fumes, literally. Uh, we were about 20 miles away, just crossed the ridge line into the Bagram Bowl, 20 miles away, and I'm like, guys, I'm sorry, I got to leave you, but I got to get, I got to get there. Uh, I'm gonna run out of gas here, and uh, uh, that's one of the first time I ever used minimum fuel. And uh, Tower said, okay, and uh, just rolled it on in, rolled it right into the parking pad, and they filled it up with, I had maybe 10 gallons to spare. Uh, I was out of gas, and uh, so just, and that was one day. <laughs> that was one day. <laughs> uh, and is that in the movie? That isn't. No, that's in the book. Um, okay. What's not in the movie that that's in the book was a really good fight. The uh, the high value target guy we went after. Um, it started great because one, uh, the two female pilots were taking the our soft guys, Special Operations Force, our Green Berets, uh, to go in. As we went, as we crossed over in the Tagal Valley, uh, we flew ahead of them and uh, circled the landing zone, the LZ, um, made sure no, nothing was there, nobody was there. And uh, they landed, but as, uh, I'm not supposed to say her name, uh, we'll call her Mary, that's what I call her in the book. But um, she said that, yeah, they came into land, so it's two Chinooks and a Black Hawk are in a Chinook's behind her. She's in a Chinook. She's got another Chinook behind her and another Black Hawk behind her. Everybody's going to land in this LZ. She said as she's coming into land, uh, a guy comes walking out uh, right in the middle of it, stops, and uh, he's got an AK strapped across his back. He's got a man dress on, and uh, he stops and looks at him, and uh, she said, oh, yeah, he just stopped right in front of us, and and was there. I'm like, well, what'd you do? She goes like, I landed on him. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> she goes like, yeah. She goes, I, I couldn't because the Chinook and the Hawk are behind me. I couldn't go around or land short. So I landed on him. And I'm like, no way. She goes, yeah. 
landed on them, and uh, on the ICS tells the soft guys, like, hey, there's somebody under the nose of the helicopter with a AK. They run around the front, drag the guy out from underneath, and uh, pick him up. He's all dazed, and then they uh, they look at him like, hubby, look at this. They look at the uh, picture. It was him. It was Hafazula, the guy we were going to get. <laughs> she, was, she got the first kill. <laughs> and, uh, and she says, she goes, yeah, it's my little, uh, uh, what would you call it? my little uh, – helping hand for the day but yeah that was the, the hvt we were going after was right there they um popped him in the nose stuffed him in the back and she took him back uh, after they dropped everybody off everybody runs around to the different homes around the lz that they were going to be looking for the other his lieutenants and stuff like that um we're circling the apaches uh, we're circling there's two of us um then Beast 5'4", uh, the Green Beret guy, big guy, goes, uh, hey, uh, Deadwood, and that was our call sign, hey, Deadwood, uh, Beast Elements moving our targets and all that. Like, Sounds great. Um, loud and clear. Um, and what we found out the next day, or, you know, the next day was on their embitters, their little handheld radios, they had the shorty antenna. So when they were in the middle of the field, we heard them clear. Once they got underneath any uh, – of the trees and stuff, mm -hmm. it was uh, broken and garbled. Uh, we're circling, and we heard him say something about getting shot at or whatever, and uh, we're like, man, we're looking, we're looking, we're looking, and um, I see a house, and when I say house, these are these uh, adobe homes, yeah. um, and I'm thinking, like, wow, check that out. Um, the green lasers are going at it, and the red lasers are going back. This is daytime. So I'm, I'm thinking, wow, that, that is weird looking. That's They're shooting. And then I look at the side of the house, and it's got like a, this, um, like an old 1980s rock concert um, fog coming off the side of the house. It was the uh, the dust of the house from the bullets hitting it. it was all coming down the side. Like, wow, that's cool as anything. Uh, and then on the top of the roof, there's all the uh, Afghan army guys and our Green Berets shooting back at this orchard. Um, and uh, I'm like, oh, wow, there they are. Uh, Chalk one, dash one, he gets a, um, he gets hit. He says, like, oh, man, I, we just took a round. And uh, well, all right, fight's on. And we know it's in this orchard. So uh, we start taking turns rolling in and hitting them with the gun and the rockets and stuff in the orchard. And then uh, at the same time, Beast 5-4 and his guys were going on this other direction. Um to another house. They were about to cross an alleyway and their first sergeant runs across the alleyway and gets mowed down by a uh, uh, PKM, a uh, uh, wow. 7.62. It hits just above his body armor on his, I'm trying to show it here, on his left uh, chest, uh, but it hits his radio, uh, his embitter. Oh, wow. And so he ends up on the other side of the uh, alleyway and uh, so he's on the ground there. And every time Beast and the other soft guys were trying to get across, the PKM would just start, you know, lighting up the, uh, the alleyway from an orchard adjacent to the orchard we were shooting in. And um, so all we heard was machine gun fire, orchard, blah, 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 something. Okay. All right. I'm going to come around and I'm going to take a run in shoot one rocket, one rocket only, and right as I get over where I knew our guys were in that orchard on that alleyway, and uh, that way there's no way I can hit them, and I'm going to shoot into the orchard, and then hopefully he can say, yeah, adjust left, right, up, or down, doesn't matter. Um, at the same time, my Apache was having uh, maintenance issues. The stabilator, what you would call the elevator on a fixed wing, it was continually... Uh, Alarming, fail, and driving down, pushing the nose over. Um, so as I came in rolling in, um, right as I was about to squeeze off that one rocket, boom, I hear the master caution or the master warning light, stabilator pitches down, the nose pitches down, and five rockets come out instead of one. And, uh, and they all land so short that I'm pulling back on the stick so I don't hit the ground. Um, and I'm like, oh, crap. It shot 
way closer than I, way closer than I ever expected. And my, at that time, my captain in the front seat was going, wow, man, you put all five high explosive rockets in that orchard. I'm like, uh, yeah, I meant to push them out further. And um, uh, the radios were silent then. I'm like, oh my God, I think I just killed Beast 5-4 and those guys down there because I'd shot them so, sh Ooh, that was a bad word. I had fired all the rockets that landed so far short. I thought, oh my God, I killed our own guys. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, roll on up, roll around. And actually, you know that video I sent you with the, the white phosphorus cloud out the left window? That was the fight there. Um, it was a few, well, it felt like, a, felt like an hour later, but a, probably a few seconds later, he goes like, good shot, good shot. And I'm like, ooh, sweet baby Jesus, thank, thank you. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, wow. Um, so that happened. Fight's over, about another 30 minutes. Uh, Schnooks come back pick everybody up, we're on the way out, and then uh, the drone up high says, hey, uh, hey, task force, you're, uh, there's somebody in the middle of the field back there, uh, y'all, and we're going like, oh my God, we left somebody. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're fixing to turn around, you know, the Apache-wise, we're fixing to turn around, and, uh, and then he calls back, saying, no, no, it's a local, he's picking up brass. <laughs> so um, we get back, and uh, and that's the other I think the other picture I showed you of the high value targets that we had on their stuff that cuffed there on their, the ramp at Bagram. Um, we get back and the SF guys, the soft guys, go one way. We kind of go the other way. I'm thinking, like, oh my god, you know, I don't know how close I came to killing uh, Beast. And um, about I think it was the next day or two days later, I'm in the Chow Hall and uh, <laughs> and. I look out at the entrance door, and I mean, this guy is huge, man. This guy is like seriously huge, and uh, he's looking around in the chow hall, and then he looks over there at me, and he's going, like, "You, come here!" I'm like, "Oh my god!" <laughs> and uh, so I come walking over there, and uh, my captain goes with me because he's thinking the same thing. Like, man, he's fixing up, pound me into the dirt for trying to kill him, and uh, and I'm like, "Oh my god! Oh my god!" And he goes walking up, and he goes like, "Oh." Wham, man, he just gives me this huge bear hug. And I'm like, <laughs> he's going, dude, that's some of the best shooting I've ever seen. <laughs> and then <laughs> that's when he told me that um, they had the shorty antenna. Um, that's when he told me that when they were stranded on that side of the alleyway, they were taking that PKM fire from the orchard that um, he goes that, I don't know how you knew, but you put all five rockets on that uh, machine gun nest and wiped it out. I'm like, yeah, that's what I meant to do. And, <laughs> so that's the other picture that's in the book is, uh, uh, he, I said, you know, one of the few times, actually probably the only time I said, well, how many were in there or whatever? He's going like, we couldn't tell. There was just body parts everywhere. But one guy was trying to crawl away behind a little fence. And he said, so I, uh, you know, took a shot at him and I hit him in the hip and the bullet came out the front end. And uh, he said yeah, he'll never reproduce again. But um, they stuffed him in the back of the, you know, the schnook and brought him back. Um, so I was going, like, yeah, man, that uh, was, uh, I meant to do all that. <laughs> so, um, I am the greatest. Yeah, I am the greatest. And, all. and then after that, it was funny because we went to uh, the A10s, uh, Tusk One and Two. Uh, they were they showed up kind of mid party, and. Um, they want to take a gun run in there too, and I'm thinking, oh hell yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna film this now. Uh, you know, watch an A10, you know, uh, drop a lot of 30 HEI into that uh, orchard, and uh, then the soft guys kept saying like, okay, we need a, uh, uh, we we've got you 100 meters clear to the south, and Tuss says like, ah, we need 150 meters, and I'm like, okay, you got 150 meters. There's no way they could have run 50 meters in three seconds. So, uh, and Tusco's like, yeah, we need 200 meters. And they're going like, eh, you know what? The Apaches already took care of everything. So we didn't get to watch them hit a gun run on that. Um, but we showed the, um, we showed up to the Air Force side. Uh, they're in Bagram. And we, um, I was going to swap tapes with them, you know, videos with them. And uh, he said the same thing, that their recorder didn't work. Um my recorder did, but I had I only had one camera, so uh, 
you know, it wasn't gun camera footage. So, yeah. Was this 2003? Do I know? Was this 2003, 2000? Uh, 2006. Oh. Okay. And they're, um, yeah, our, our recorder, sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't. They had swapped from a digital 8 millimeter uh, recorder to a hard drive recorder. And that thing was nothing but problems. So had you had you upgraded to the uh, Apache the H sixty four D or you still yeah, the Delta, yeah not till I got back uh, I went to the longbow course in uh, I want to say two thousand and eight two thousand eight or nine I went to the longbow course and uh, yeah it's great idea uh, switch all the manual switches and everything now they're touch not touch screen but uh, fabs, uh, not fabs, uh, variable action buttons. Um, it looks just like, you know, the, um, uh, what do you call that? Both on the Viper and the Hornet. We've got the screen, but all the buttons on the side do different uh, things depending uh, on which OSBs, menu. Is. Yeah, the push yeah. buttons on the side. Yeah, we call them fabs, variable, variable action buttons. Um, so you would have thought that they went from a steam gauge cockpit to a, um, glass cockpit. Um, things would have been better. All they did was switch from manual switches to buttons, and uh, it picked up almost a thousand pounds oh, uh, with the radar and all the radar stuff. Um, we, when we showed up to Afghanistan, we were literally the last ride, the last ride of the Alpha model in the cavalry. Uh, we were the last Alpha models in Afghanistan. Um, we showed up and relieved two six cav that had longbows, and when they looked at ours, they're going, "Ah, oh, dude." Um, we had alpha models with Delta General Electric uh, 700, 701 Delta engines. And um, you go, man, you got Ferraris. Uh, we were a thousand pounds lighter than them with the same engines they had. So we had more than enough power. Uh, still not enough to come to a hover, not you know, with a full combat load above. So really your, above. your Chinook story where you barely cleared would not have happened in a longbow. Whew, that's a good one. Um, when you get that tight of a, when you get it, when you get into a fight, and everybody is in that close proximity, we're talking the entire battle was in less than a half a mile radius mm -hmm. uh, from the LZ, less than that, probably less than a quarter of a mile from the landing zone, um, and everybody's running through the trees. So how good did Blue Force Tracker and all that work, and picking out particular people, you know. The only reason I knew where everybody was is because on the briefing the day before, they you know gave us the maps of the uh, the target houses, the landing zone, the orchards, and all that sort of stuff, and all the uh, the satellite pictures. And being prior infantry, man, I, I look at that stuff and uh, you know photographic memory. And uh, so I knew you know our guys were here, there, there, and here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's as for the longbow helping out. No, nah, that, that glass cockpit stuff, Yeah, that, that was an outside fight. Um, right. And that was one of the things they found out with the longbow is that all the Army guys were so enthralled with the glass cockpit and everything that they're like, uh, they're looking more inside than they are outside. Yeah, and, no, uh, I, I just meant because of the power. Like, you wouldn't have had the oh. power to clear the ridge because of the weight. Oh, 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 oh on that, that one, yeah, no, no. Yeah. No, no there's been. no way. That would have been bad. So uh, when when you did these escorts, did the Taliban know to kind of avoid the Apache for fear yeah. of getting shot at, or did they take pot shots at you too? And how did, I mean, when you came back, did you have, you know, damage or like what, it, what did it look like after a mission? Yeah, we'd have bullet holes um, in the blades and the, in the, really in the tail boom area. If we stayed faster than, 80 knots and over 200 feet. Really, we wouldn't get shot at, except for the Tagal Valley ambush that's in the movie. Um, there was just so much shooting. Um, so, what was the original question? Sorry about that. No, I, I was just asking if the, the Taliban knew or like afraid oh. of you and, and like didn't take, because they, you know, they know to shoot a Chinook because it's a big honking target, but like an Apache, it seems like they would kind of avoid you because they know what's going to happen. And they did. We, um, we would do um, escort missions of, man, I forgot. It was a Black Hawk that had this great big square um, antenna, about a four foot by four foot 
square flat antenna up against the body of the bottom of the, the Blackhawk. So we would circle, well, I say circle, they would do a, uh, a rectangular uh, pattern around the Corongal Valley or, or whatever valley they wanted to be. And uh, they could pick up ICOM traffic, cell phone traffic, uh, and pinpoint it and all. So we said, oh, wow, that's okay, whatever. Um, that's pretty ballsy. And they said, like, so you want us in tight with you or you want us loose or what? And they said, like, no, we don't want you in the valley at all because, hell, even the Air Force guys are saying, like, yeah, we knew when you Apaches were coming close because everybody starts running into the caves. The, the nice. Fights start and they start running into the caves. So um, actually, that's in the, uh, I think that's in the book too. The um, We were in a briefing to some general um, that was coming into Afghanistan and somebody in the briefing put on their uh, ICOM traffic. Uh, it says, um, yeah, ICOM intercept. We cannot do attacks right now. There are Apaches in the area. And, uh, nice. and that's all it said. Yeah, so <laughs> that general was like, what does that mean? And we're like, oh. <laughs> it means we're, nice. We're, yeah, we're saving American lives just by being there. That's and, awesome. Uh, so, Did you yeah. feel pretty protected in the thing? I mean, was it armored enough that for what they were, I mean, do you feel like it, it had a good shot? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, even, even, you know, when Davey got shot and it hit him and it came to the, you know, just like the, you know, fast movers, the canopies are not bulletproof. Right. Um, but it's still... You know, when you're flying the Apache, yeah, you are the greatest. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> when, when they're shooting at you with the little bullets and we're shooting back with this, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you definitely feel like you're the man. Um, did you, and I, did you, yeah. I was going to say, did you have to do any CSAR missions or anything for down helicopters? No, not really CSAR, but we'd circle around um, the Chinook. Um, they had a maintenance issue. Um, actually, now you say that, yeah. Um, on the way back from a, a ring route and everything, the Chinook with the girls uh, had to do an emergency landing uh, way on the Kunar River. And uh, once they landed, uh, the village that was about maybe half a mile away, everybody starts running towards the, uh, the Chinook. And we're like, oh, my God, uh, you know, we kind of figured, yeah, it's mainly the, the local civilians think like, all right, <laughs> Uncle Sam's here with the big Walmart in the uh, the back of the Chinook. We're going to get free stuff. and uh, But we couldn't let that happen. And so we made runs in. Um, you're just a high-speed, low-level pass between us, between the Chinook and the, uh, the people coming and just throwing flares out, you know, uh, popping flares everywhere. And that stopped them the first time. Um, and then other ones tried sneaking around the edges, and so we'd come around there, and, uh, you know, pop flares over them and all. That's but uh, yeah, you don't want to. Uh, yeah, show of force is what it is. But yeah, you don't yeah. want to. You just can't go shooting anybody you see there. Right. Not right. everybody is the enemy. Um, so yeah, there's no way we could have right. legally, morally, taken a shot at those people, thinking that oh, they're the Taliban, you know, and. And all yeah. that. Yeah, there's no way you can do that. So uh, when you're when you're in country, I mean, I guess having two engines, I mean, the threat of having to auto rotate in the bad guy land. I mean, are you thinking about that? Like the whole time you're flying, like, hey, I, if I need to put it down, here's where I'm going. Is that like always in your cross check, or are you going to limp it as far as you can on one engine? <laughs> uh, it could fly on one engine. We, we'd yeah. have to jettison all the stores. Now, obviously, depending on how high we were and how hot it was, but. Yeah, she could easily make it back on one engine, uh, back to Jalalabad or eh, maybe yeah, Bagram. We'd have to get over the the ridge line, but um, yeah, I had no problems with that. You just if you if you lost an engine in the corn gall, um, yeah, you are definitely making a beeline to the entrance, which was at a lower altitude uh, of the valley, uh, dumping the wing stores and you know getting that fine airspeed of about eighty knots. Uh, max l over d to make it out of there uh but yeah there's no place there, there is no place to land there um yeah. it's the mountain there there's just, there really is no place to land so how many trips did you end up doing just one uh, one war is enough for me wow um, one that is all in one trip good lord oh no that yeah that, that those are only what two or three this was all year long after 
Yeah, April, May, it was fighting pretty much every day, every other day for the entire year. Um, and it culminated, like I said, the last battle in, in the movie, uh, above the best, is uh, that one was everything everything you could think of in a nightmare. It was, I was not supposed to be on that mission. Um, I was supposed to be uh, uh, QRF, Quick Reactionary Force, that day out of Bagram. It had just been snowing um, for, what, geez, seven days or whatever. Um, I was supposed to be, like I said, quick reactionary force. I was going to stick around Bagram, uh, finally get caught up on emails and everything else. And, uh, <laughs> oh, email. <laughs> yeah. um, and, uh, but standard operating procedure was the other aircraft that was going to be escorting the two Blackhawks uh, on the mission on that ring route that day. Um, my captain was one of the pilots on it. Uh, he said, Hey, um, make sure your aircraft is up on the APU on the P um, because if there's breaks, they just jump in my helicopter and they go on the mission and then, you know, still quick reactionary force. Our, our mechanics have time to fix that. And then now that becomes the QRF bird. Um, as I'm sitting out there, we're both myself and uh, Les um, and my co-pilot were sitting there on the APU and uh, we're watching, and sure enough, here comes the captain, comes running across the flight line over to my helicopter. I said, all right, man, let's get your stuff ready. We're fixing to get more helicopter. And uh, he opens up my canopy, and he, and he hands me the packet, uh, the mission pack, and he goes like, my helmet's broke. You're taking this. I'm like, oh, no way. <laughs> and uh, so we crank it up. The, the hawks are sitting there, and I go, all right, where are we going? They're going, like, we're going to Corngall Valley. I'm like, that is, that was the time. This was the end of the year. I only had maybe a week or so left before we were leaving, um, and literally that was the time mover. I said, "This is going to be a bad day." My stomach just knotted up. Wow. I almost had a um, uh, an anxiety attack right there because I think we can't go back to the Congo. We're going to get killed today. This is you just get that overwhelming feeling that you know. I've been there several, you know, quite a few times over the year in battles and all that, but this was the first time I thought, this is going to suck. This is going to really hurt today. Um, wow. We took off um, the whole time. My stomach is just in a knot. I'm thinking, God, this just can't be happening. Um, and we ended up, uh, you'd have to read it in the book, but we ended up uh, landing short at uh, Satabad because there was a fight going on in the Pesh River Valley that leads into the Korangal Valley. And uh, yeah, into the movie, the you know the we're authorized to go single ship to uh, stop the fighting, which that was a call made by the commander there at Abad, which was not legal whatsoever. But being you know being the super trooper, I said, all right, man. Uh, I talked with Les. I said, okay, it's right there. It's on the main road. If anything happens, you know, at least we can make it to the road and our guys are there and uh, and all that. So we took off and shot up some caves and stuff. And then uh, about halfway through that little deal, uh, they call us back saying like, hey, you're not supposed to be out there single ship. You need to come back. <laughs> and uh, so we come back and then they send the Blackhawk with us. So that way we're not single ship. I'm thinking, oh, great. Um, we shoot up more caves uh, and I say caves. A Taliban had fired upon this um convoy in that Pesh River Valley from that ridge line and uh, uh, as soon as we showed up they jumped back in the caves and they wanted us to shoot up the caves and kill them and we did we ended up killing quite a few of them but um, then the gun stopped working Ooh. and I thought oh crap um, I was thinking I hope we didn't break the gun um, found out I knew that like three weeks prior Somebody misloaded the Apache there at Asadabad and broke the entire uploading chain um, system to load bullets into that Apache. And basically it was hard down big time maintenance wise, like down for like two weeks. Um, wow. I did not realize then that they had taken all of our um, our reef, uh, rearming guys out of Asadabad. So when our gun stopped working, 
after 115 rounds that we shot, uh, and we normally hold 330. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I thought, like, well, Nate, you know, we broke the gun. Went back to Asadabad, kid runs up to us, um, hooks into the wing pylon, says, like, hey, sir, do you need fuel and you need ammo? I'm like, yeah, we need gas and we need uh, 30 mil, or check my gun out. It's not working. And yes, uh, give me, you know, 19 uh, high explosive rockets in the in the alpha zone, you know, so I kind of do that. And I'm going like in the alpha zone. He's going like, OK. And so kid runs off, um, comes running back with a rocket. And uh, uh, he looks up at me like this. And I'm going, yeah, that's it. And um, so he throws it into it wasn't the A zone in the rocket pod. And uh, he puts it in pointy in first. He put it in backwards. And all, so I'm like, no, I'm banging on the canopy, like, stop! <laughs> that's, that's you're putting it in backwards. My co-pilot says, I'll take care of this. He jumps out. They helps him load up some rockets. He opens up the side bay on the Apache. Not, this whole time, the Apache's running at 100. Um, and uh, he says, hey, he gets back and he says, hey, we're out of bullets. That's all. And I'm like, oh, cool. Put some more bullets in it. And so you know, <laughs> I'll um, take them. Yeah. And he, uh, they come back with the big cans of a 30 millimeter and, um, he, um, and then they just sit there and look at us. <laughs> so Les gets back out and he says, gets back and he says, like, they don't have the upper dupper, the uploader downloader. It's a, a starter little electric motor with a gear drive or whatever that you put the bullets in and you load the bullets through the gun back oh. up into the Apache when the they broke the apache three weeks prior idaho national guard whose apaches whose rearmament guys were there they said hey we're taking our guys home and uh so there were no rearmament guys at asadabad that day and so we couldn't get any bullets and i'm like oh crap so less than i go well you know what let's tell them hey let's um tell them we'll go back to jalalabad which is about a 30 minute flight south, refuel, rearm with our guys. I'll be back up here in an hour. We'll, and then we can go to the Corngall Valley, which is where the general wanted to go. And uh, so uh, next thing I see is the, the general's running out to the Black Hawk in front of us and saying, uh, then the uh, LZ controller says, um, the code says, you've got rockets and missiles we're going. And I'm like, crap, man, we don't have bullets. Um, and then the Black Hawk pilot says, Hey, do you guys want to lead us in there? I've never been there before. I'm like, Oh my God. Uh, we've been going, everybody's been going to Cornwall Valley all year long. And now he, this kid doesn't know where we're going. Um, so, and then he says like, Hey, you can shoot those caves up on the way in there. I'm like, oh, dang it. So we go in there. Um, I'm leading them. And this is actually the video that I show at speaking events. Um, and this is the last battle in there, but they edited a lot of it out. I lead the Black Hawk in there to the Corn Gall Outpost, uh, also known as the Lumber Yard. Um, the second that they land, they come under attack. Um, nobody tells us this. We're circling overhead at about 500 feet above them you know, circling overhead because we cannot land there because that's just an incredible target to have an Apache on the ground. Um, so next, you know, the, the black Hawk kid says, Hey, do you guys want to lead us out of here? And I'm thinking like, no, enough's enough. Say nope to dope. Um, I go, I can only cover you from behind and all. And he's going, okay. Then they get attacked. Um, the general is outside the, the Black Hawk. Um, somebody runs up the Black Hawk and tells him, get the hell out of here, we're under attack. He takes off. He leaves the left door gunner of the Black Hawk on the ground, still hooked up on his um, helmet mic or helmet cord. And it pulls his helmet cord uh, <laughs> as the Black Hawk takes off. And he takes off to the south. Like I said, you come in and go out of the corn gall from the north. And so I thought, okay, there he goes. I, all this, like I said, is all on video with the audio and everything. You can hear me saying, like, well, there he goes. He's headed to the south. And I'm expecting him to 
just make a quick turn and turn to the north and, and beat feet out of there. Um, and he still heads south. And right at that time, the ground controller says, egress to the north now, egress to the north now. And I'm thinking, like, well, that, that was a stupid question. Yeah, you know, yeah, both Deadwood and Archangel egressing to the north this time. And I'm thinking, that was, that was a, you know, that was a dumb question. <sighs> I'm just now pulling up on his high five o'clock on the Blackhawk, and you can hear me tell on the ICS to my co pilot, like, you know, come on, Bubba, turn, you know, get, quit heading south. And then the Blackhawk calls back, like, we're taking smoke right now, possible poo site, point of origin. Um, and we're both looking out, you know, down at the uh, Blackhawk, thinking, like, what the hell is he talking about? He, he was flying over the guys that were shooting, that were attacking from the south. He flew right over. Um, oh, crap. He flew continually south for about another quarter of a mile to literally the end of the Box Canyon, nothing but houses, Taliban town, big time. Um, and he starts turning back to the north at the bottom of the ravine, uh, at the bottom of the whole valley, back to the Corngall outpost. And I'm thinking, like, dude, um, you need to pick up your speed as fast as you can. Uh, this is really not good being down here like this. And uh, nobody, it's, nobody still said anything about nobody getting taken fire or nothing like that. Um, I would have to point it out on the video, but as he turns back to the north, uh, and I'm coming up on, like I said, it's five o'clock high. You can see the bullets coming at me from my right side. I mean, plain as day, uh, just a string, a string of bullets they were shooting at me. Um, and then there's more bullets coming at him uh, from his side at me. Um, and then he does, right when he's a beam, the Corngall outpost, he turns up and towards me. The sun is just cresting the east side of the ridge line, coming over. I'm looking down to my left at about my two o'clock low at him. And uh, you hear me on the video say like, ooh, what was that? I saw a flash on the, um, the, uh, the uh, mast where the rotor is on a Blackhawk, it's chrome. Um, I saw a flash and I thought it was the sun glinting off of the mast. And then that's when I see the RPG coming through it right after that. The RPG went between the blade and between the body of the Blackhawk. And Holy crap. Coming, coming up at me, or I say coming up towards us, and then another RPG shooting across him from his right over to his left. And then everybody on that ridge line is shooting at him. I mean, just everybody was shooting at him. And they, and they can hear me say like, ooh, there they are. Uh, I rolled it on over hard left. Um, I roll in on him, and there's all those... Uh, just like the uh, the other corn gold fight, they're all shooting at the uh, the Blackhawk, and they look up at me coming in out of the sun, <laughs> and they're all going like, "Oh, sweet baby Jesus!" And so I had no bullets. Um, it sounds really corny, but it was true. I had no bullets, and I could not switch to rockets because I was too close. Because the corn gold outpost was just on the other side of the big ravine uh, from where everything was happening, so I couldn't shoot a rocket for fear of overshooting and hitting the, the Cornwall outpost. Um, so I drove the helicopter right at them so they would shoot at me instead of the Blackhawk. And, uh, and they did. They swung their, their weapons around at me, um, pulled up hard to the left. Um, you hear me on the radio saying, like, you guys didn't, you know, egress out of here, egress out of here, you're taking fire. Um, I make one call saying, like, the lumber yard, understand there's nobody up here. Because in combat, in the real no shit combat, you never know. You don't know um, where the friendlies are and where the enemy are when it's when it's an, an ambush like that or an attack like that. And you never know, man. They could have been a, an American patrol. You just never know. So I just made the call saying, like, you know, I'm saying there's uh, nobody else up here, no friendlies. Um, I roll the helicopter over, pointing at that ridge line, and um, you can see. The smoke from everybody shooting at me, you can see the bullets coming by the canopy. <laughs> and uh, and that's when you hear me say, like, whoa. I pitch up the, the Apache to get out of the stream of gunfire. And um, 
Uh, wow. And that's what I'm thinking, like, oh, crap. Literally, I thought, I envisioned right then my front seater taking around through the noggin, and, and then the blast shield between him and I was going to be coated with his blood. Um, and then uh, I'm going, like, man, I'm out of here. And then I'm thinking, no, I'm not. I'm going to kill these bastards. So I shove the nose over to take a rocket shot at them. So we're in a negative G push. Um, and that's the great thing about the Apache, the Cobra could never do. So I had like a one and a half negative on the uh, G-Wiz meter when all this was over. Um, pitched it over to line it back up and then see that same dust cloud. And it's on the video. You can see the uh, the RPG, which I thought, because it looked like it wiggled, like it corrected. And I thought, oh, crap, it's a man pad. Um, so I thought, well, shoot. I'm going to shoot too. If you're going to shoot me, I'm going to shoot you. And, um, uh Wow. As that's coming at me, I'm in the negative G push, lined up the nose, and I'm squeezing the trigger, and nothing's coming out because the Apache's got a, a safety inhibitor that will not let it shoot if you're less than a half positive G. You don't want to fly. Right. You don't want to shoot your own rotor off. Um, uh, so I'm squeezing the trigger. Going out, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> Every time I'm pulling the trigger and nothing's coming out, and I'm trying to line up, you know, try to get a half a positive G, Lined up, and sure enough, literally, literally, as they say, by the grace of God, lined it up, and boom, one rocket goes out and literally hits right there amongst all the uh, Taliban, and roll on out, and go like, ah, you know, do what you're supposed to do is flares away, flares away as you're doing your regress, uh, do a hard turn, and uh, now, like I said, I, I tried doing a harder turn than I, than I could, so I'm, I'm shoving left pedal trying to skidded around and uh when i rolled back out squeezing the trigger again i'm like good god it's not firing it has another safety inhibit you got to be in trim <laughs> and uh really yeah so then i finally wow. got it you know it, within a half a ball trim and uh you know just started wailing away at the ridge line I, it was funny because you could see the guy i said it's funny it's funny now um but yeah you can see all the guys going like oh habib i told you <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I just waylay on them, and then, um, well, you have to see in the movie, but yeah, same thing. Uh, a World War II guy had told me uh, um, when he was flying Corsairs down there in Okinawa, um, or Iwo Jima, I mean, he uh, he said that, yeah, wiggle the pedals so all your rockets at least disperse. Um, because I say I was close enough, and we'd gotten so good with shooting rockets, you know, you could put, well, all five rockets in one orchard. And I didn't want to do that, so I just wiggled the pedals back and forth, and you know. Uh, so as the rockets are leaving, they're all hitting in mm -hmm. the area, not the area. And um, yeah, so fired off all my high explosives, came around with a uh, oh, flechettes, uh, fired flechette rounds. There you go. So that is a two-inch hardened steel nail. Um, so it comes out like a shotgun blast. Uh, so you fired, you know, fired all those flechette rockets, and then uh, white phosphorus, and basically I had nothing left. All I had were two Hellfire missiles left, and at seventy-five thousand a whack, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was pissed off anyway. So I was like, yeah, I'm not going to go through the whole nut roll of firing a missile at these people. Um, God. Yeah, and then we had to, you know, went back, followed the black car to a bad, and then, um, and then we had to go back and get the general. So I had to go right back in there again. Um, but by Still this time, no well, by this time, the world knew what was happening. Um, they took our guys from JBAD, brought them up there. They, re oh man, it was like NASCAR. Landed, <laughs> they're refueling me, rearming me, and I'm walking around the helicopter looking for uh, damage. Everybody's looking at the, you know, for damage, and not a bullet whatsoever hit me. The Blackhawk was lit up. That, that boy, mm. if that crew chief, that was left on the ground would have stayed in his seat. Well, all that wouldn't have happened, but um, the bullet would have gone through his noggin because there was a bullet right on the top of where his head was that knocked the generator out of, on the uh, the Blackhawk. So he was hmm. lucky that he was not on that flight. Um, wow. Yeah. So, uh, but and you'll have to see in the movie what actually happened on the ground. And that's the biggest difference on the movie is that. It's got the battles from the air and the same battle on the ground. So, 
Wow. Yeah, uh, definitely, definitely got to check that out. So, and then after, was that your last hoorah? I mean, the way to yeah. end the, geez, yeah. so then. Yeah, not only the movie, but yeah, <laughs> for real. <laughs> well, so we've, we've anchored on that and you still have time, right? I'm not, I'm not taking, oh, yeah. I know it's getting oh, yeah. late, but I really want to ask you about your time at customs because to me, that's yeah. equally fascinating. The law enforcement side of kind of what you did. So you, you got hired, you said in 99. Yeah. When it was uh, U.S. Customs. Okay. And what, what was the difference back then? I mean, kind of how did it evolve and what were you doing? So, yeah, yeah. Back then, it was the greatest gun and flying club in the world. Um, we, holy mackerel, whatever, whatever I wanted to do, I could do for that week. Whether I wanted to do warrants out of the helicopter, chase drug runners down on the border in the helicopter, or... Back then, it was the, uh, uh, well, we were flying out of uh, Columbia, uh, but at the time, uh, they had to move us to Aruba. And uh, so we were based out of Aruba, flying into Columbia and uh, chasing the drug runners out of there, um, which was interesting. Like I said, the Citation jet that we flew, that I flew, um, it had the APG-66 radar, which is the same radar as the F-16. I don't know if it still has the same one, does it? Uh, it's APG-68 now. Oh, yeah. So That's, that's yeah, the A model. That's the first F-16 radar. Right. So it has the uh, the, the um, air intercept radar and uh, a FLIR camera. One of the original ones is pretty bad. So they ended up with, um, uh, we would fly out of Aruba. Okay, okay on one mission. Um, we were launched. See, I don't know if I can say this. So we have a way. Of, <laughs> don't say anything classified. We don't, yeah, I don't no, want somebody to kick in my door. <laughs> um, so we got intel that a plane was taking off from Columbia loaded up with dope. So we know this. So they launch us from Aruba to find him, to find him. Uh, and I say this because the intel was only good for so many miles and so many minutes. Is that a good way? That's not saying anything, is it? I don't think that's saying anything classified. So uh, we would fly into Columbia in looking in this airspace with that radar. Once we hook up the guy, once we catch him on radar, um, we follow him northbound. Um, I say covertly. We do uh, your standard... Uh, Cata. we do our, your standard intercept where we would stay a certain distance away from him and get around him and then get behind him a certain distance to do a vid and then uh and then back it off and then follow him until another asset would hook him up and then follow him because we did not have the legs to go across the entire uh, caribbean um so the other asset, I guess I can say what. No. Anyway, the other asset would follow him um, over Cuba to Southern Florida, and then uh, hand it off to the Homestead guys uh, with their citations and their Blackhawks and all that. And then they would make the end game happen there in uh, Florida. Uh, meanwhile, that plane would turn around and go back to Columbia. So the, the entire time, we have positive PID. We have positive identification of this aircraft uh, and filming it and everything. Positive ID, positive handoff when he makes it all the way back to Columbia. So the next hours later, you know, probably the next day, when he's coming back, uh, we get launched again uh, from Aruba. And then they would hook us up with that same plane. And then we would follow him in to Columbia. And then the Colombian Air Force with their A-37s, um, and those don't have any legs at all, nor speed. So we would have to definitely get the cat on them uh, for, for them to meet us on a head-on uh, deal with the bad guy in front of us. Once they got hooked up with us, um, then we would tell them, yes, that's the guy. That's him you got it now we'd back off and uh we'd still we'd still keep eyes on 
Um, the Colombian Air Force would then, you know, tell them like, hey, Colombian Air Force here, you are hereby ordered to go land at, uh, you know, whatever place, Air Force Base. Um, follow us now. And then uh, if they didn't do anything, they'd pull up next to them, rock the wings. And if they still didn't do anything, then they, it was pretty cool, they'd uh, roll across in front of them and they couldn't thump them. But uh, they, with the minigun uh, on that A-37, just fire a string of uh, tracers in front of them to get their attention. And then uh, if they still didn't, which they didn't, um, respond, um, then they followed him to where he landed. Uh, and then they would, uh, it was, I think it was a four-shot rocket tube. It was real small. You know, the thing has no payload whatsoever. Um, so they fired four rockets, blew up the plane in the area right around the, the strip. And then they dropped, uh, they had like one, I want to call it a 100-pound bomb. Um and then straight fought the last of the bullets in the tree line all around it. And then there you go. <laughs> That's a, wow. Um, so that was U.S. Customs. Uh, so I did that, like I said, Colombia, Mexico, uh, other places. Um, yeah, we did that a lot of places. Then after 9-11, uh, Homeland Security, Customs Border Protection, did a lot of the, um, uh, the TFR uh, out of the uh, National Capital Region, out of the, over D.C., the no-fly, uh, or the, the restricted area. Uh, we did a lot of stuff there. Um, actually, this is a really good story. Um, <laughs> nice. So remember, after 9-11, uh, Tom Ridge was the man. And so we're sitting there at uh, Reagan Airport and uh, on the on the ready, uh, the alert aircraft and the citation. And... Um, a uh, front had just come through. It's in the morning. We just showed up, and one of the other guys goes like, "Wow, this is a great day for somebody to bust the TFR." And because uh, we'd always been having the, the traffic, uh, helicopters and airplanes would always not be squawking the, the correct code, and so we'd launch on them. But um, yeah, front came through, clear blue skies and all. And uh, next week on the radio and on the cell phones, they'd say, "Launch now. We've got an unknown rider." 11,500 over Dulles headed for the White House. And we're like, oh, oh crap. And uh, so we run out to the jet, you know, crank it up. And, you know, oh, my God, Reagan's so busy. Uh, and the front come through, so they were taking off to the, out, up the river, not down the river. And um, so we were on the diagonal runway there. And, um, man, that guy's like an auctioneer, that uh, ground controller. He's like, you know, you know, he say United Port, you know, clear to land, you know, Delta, whatever, clear to land, all these, just so fast. And he finally goes like, um, Homeland clear to land between, you know, the two jets on the runway. And um, he slowed, sped one up and slowed one down airliner. And we just took off right between them on the um, the runway diagonal. Uh, take off, immediate climb to 11. And as we're climbing on up, uh, hook him up on the radar, got him on the flare, and we're, gonna make a closure and um and they said not back it off back it off the uh the vipers are in they're gonna make contact with him <laughs> so we're like okay and so i mean man they just you know full blower man they just thumped the guy and it was a beach twin uh, a twin beach an old tail dragger twin beach uh two radial engines corrugated body um and a little twin tail uh tail dragger um and so we're looking at it, and you know, yeah, 16 is just you know thumping the guy, uh, throwing flares, you know, full blower and everything. We're like, wow, that's pretty cool. And then they go like, he's not responding. Uh, clear the area. They're fixing to go kinetic on the guy. And we're like, oh shit, <laughs> DC Jeez. is below us. Uh, yeah. We're thinking, wow. Uh, so we back off, and uh, we're thinking, oh my god, this is going to be really wild. Um, they're going to shoot this guy. And then next thing he's like, okay. Omaha, that was our call sign. Omaha, uh, we made contact with him. He's going to the the airport east across the bay from Annapolis is um, is still in Maryland. Um, I've got the name of the airport, but it's right on the, the west shoreline east of Annapolis uh, uh, across the bay there. And so we follow him. We, we land. Um, I was co-pilot. As we're taxiing in, following the guy, um, I get in the back of the citation and along with the other guy, we throw on our body armor. I've got uh, my shotgun and we got our sidearm and uh, he stops 
kind of near the guy. I'm doing, I'm doing the pilot thing. Stops near the guy, and then uh, we open the door and get out, and then there's these uh, two Maryland State Police guys. I mean, they must have been 10 foot eight. They were huge guys. And they, they go, uh, all right, and they go like, well, you're the professional here. You take the lead. And I'm thinking like, oh, crap. <laughs> so I go walk up there, and uh, the back door opens. I'm thinking, oh, my God, this is it. This is Osama bin Laden. I'm going to, you know, wide him up right there, and, you know, the whole Taliban clan. And um, and this old man hops out, and I'm thinking like, oh, my God. I go, hey, are you the only one in there? He's going, like, yeah. And I'm thinking like, hey, man, I'm with U.S. Customs, man. Do you know what you just did? And he's going, like, there were some planes up there. Just they had a fire coming out the back of them. I'm like, oh my god, dude, that was for you. And um, anybody in there? Let me look inside. And completely gutted. All he had was a little Garmin GPS on the dash and a little what was that Icom radio that uh, the little DHF radio. He was taking it there to get refurbished. And um, and I was like, wow, dude, wow. You flew right over NCR at 11.5, not squawking, not talking. He's like, I was outside of the uh, the TCA, and, uh, and I go, let me look at your maps. I, I swear, we were, they were 1970s maps. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. And uh, I was going, dude, here's a NASA uh, Form 1. I would highly recommend you fill this out. Secret Service is on their way in. Maryland State Police is going to want to talk to you and all that. I'm out of here. And uh, that was the day they was on the news when they showed everybody running out of the Capitol when it was going to be attacked again. And Tom Ridge is going, no, everything's okay. Calm down. That was that day. Uh, I was on that. <laughs> and, uh, wow. Yeah, so that, that was the jet side. After 9-11, we did not go back overseas. I still went to Mexico. Uh, working out of the embassy um, and doing intercepts in Mexico. I still do a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, they, uh, but I got to do a lot more um, uh, in the helicopter down on the border, both in Arizona, New Mexico, and all over Texas, uh, helping out Border Patrol in their helicopters with all the, the drug runners, the illegals, and all that sort of stuff. So that's the great thing about that job with Customs was whatever you wanted to do, you could pretty much do it. Um, yeah. It was a great job. Uh, I really hated leaving it after 21 years, but yeah. Uh, it was now, too much did fun. you get shot at in that job? Yeah. Yeah. But it was really a flesh wound. It was, uh, now it was, um, they shot at us from the me- Mexican side. Um, like I said, you stay above 200 feet and 80 knots. Yeah, the chances of somebody hitting you is pretty slim. Um, wow. As far as I know, um, they we knew they had uh, 50 caliber rifles. Um, these are the cartels. Um, but they knew better than to start something they really did not want to happen, which is an all-out war with the United States government against the cartels. They, they knew better than to do that. Uh, Knocking the helicopter out of the sky with a fifty cal, yeah, that would have that would have brought the full. Bring mind. the Apaches! Here yeah. come the Apaches! Yeah, um, and we did do that with the Apaches in the reserves. Nineteen ninety six, we were out of um, Del Rio, Laughlin Air Base, Laughlin, yeah. Del Rio, um, south of there, actually towards Eagle Pass, helping Border Patrol out. But for a whole month, that was our summer camp, so to speak, with the Apaches, and uh, we pretty much shut the border down. But um, it was fun. Uh, we didn't have any live rounds. We did have our pistols with you know, bullets in it, but nothing in the Apaches. Um, we shut the border down in that, that sector for that month, but at $8,000 an hour to fly the Apache, yeah, that's not sustainable. <laughs> so, Eight grand. I'm going to write that down for when I uh, eat on the market for a helicopter, I guess. No? Little, little, little too <laughs> well, no, that was the alpha model, and that was back in the 90s, and that was per hour uh, wet. No bullets. Oh. No oh. bullets, rockets, or missiles. <laughs> so. so what all did you fly for customs? You said you flew the Citation. Did you fly yep. A-Stars? Citation, A-Stars. Got checked out on the King Air 350 before I left. 
and uh, Dash 8. I flew that before I left. So I got all those type ratings. And, uh, wow. Yeah. How would you like the A-Star? Is it different? Love it, yeah. Yeah, if you, once you get your ratings all up in the, uh, the Robbie there, um, yeah, the A-Star is a Corvette. Is it's it really? A, oh, it's a, yeah. She's got power to burn both on the main rotor and on the tail rotor. Oh, yeah, you've got power to burn. And it's that's got an air. Have, that's what they have here at Hammond. They have the A-Star here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going with, uh, I was almost about to say their names, but. Yeah, yeah. No, don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. Dude, that that is awesome. So you left customs after a full career. Uh, you retired from the military, right? So you did the full full twenty on both of those. Yeah, twenty six and a half in the army, and then uh, twenty one with customs, and then uh, like I said, when I retired last year, right with COVID, um, it's I only retired because um, this EMS job that I'm doing now. Uh, it was too good to pass up. It's less than a 10 minute drive from the house, seven days on, seven off, still get to fly a helicopter for actually very uh, honorable missions, uh, yeah. especially picking up kids. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and that's a whole nother story. I'll, uh, and I got the videos and everything. It was a, a four helicopter scene crash um, that I was, my first scene, what am I saying? Um, August of last year, uh, right when I started, uh, one thing about EMS, it stands for earning money sleeping. So 99% of the time you're sitting there in the in your room on the internet or watching movies. Um, and then the other half percent is you're doing hospital transfers. That other maybe less than half percent is uh, scene calls where you're landing on the highway and you're picking up people that, you know, they messed up bad. And um, so that whole month of July when I started, were were really nothing and one or two uh hospital transfers and then august 28th with hurricane laura that was over uh your neck of the woods uh it was still here uh we got called on a scene on a crash and um four helicopters including myself showed up to that thing uh, a lot of kids and um, i ended up taking the one child um all the way to houston texas children's hospital uh but uh, the big thing about it was uh, the kid had to have his dad fly with us, which was good. My help, the EC-145, could, we could take the dad because uh, the kid had um, yeah, uh, issues and, then, uh, and injuries. And then, um, then I had to fight Hurricane Laura. All the bands were coming out over, so it almost cut me off from getting back to Houston. Um, and then, uh, so I had to get around that. Then ATC, everybody in the airlines at Intercontinental Airport, Houston, they were coming in to land to beat the storm. So uh, I had to get around underneath them and then more storms between the Bush Airport and the Med Center. Went around storms there and, uh, and dropped the kid off and everything was good. Everybody lived. Uh, wow. Yeah, so yeah, that, that, was, <laughs> that was my first scene. So that was a hell of a initiation. Is that day or night? It was day. We fly with goggles at night. Um, you do fly. You do fly with NVGs at night. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how anybody could fly without goggles. I mean, that's. You know, I've got several thousand hours flying goggles and night vision system with the Apache. So, I literally, I, I don't. Other than airplanes, I've never flown at night without being able to see. It's. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Did y'all ever fly with the panoramic, the PNVGs, the quad no. tubes? Oh no no no. no. Far? I don't know how heavy those would be. Um, yeah, they're they're actually I think from what I understand actually almost lighter because they're different, oh, really? you know, technology and stuff. Well, so yeah. what else are you doing besides EMS? Obviously, what made you decide to write this? Uh, actually, I wrote when I took twenty five hours of videos and all the pictures. Uh, I was going to come back and put the videos on DVDs. They were digital eight millimeter. Uh, put them on DVDs and just write on there, give them to the kids. Uh, so 100 years from now, my great, great grandkids could say, Dad, what was a Taliban? And I can say, well, look here. Um, the girl, Sandra, that's on the cover, she had been reading my emails uh, through a friends, through my friend. Um, she said like, wow, you write a great email. And remember in 2006, all the news was coming out of Iraq. 
So uh -huh. I would write emails to my family, friends, and all uh, about like, hey man, today we flew over the here's the pictures of the Kyber Pass, and we flew by this you know Genghis the Khan minaret or whatever. Um, oh, and we got in this good fight today, and you were there, and very few pictures because the internet was so bad, but. My e my emails were getting viewed by thousands. They were getting forwarded to a lot of people, thousands of people. Oh, I found out because <laughs> um, it was the only news coming out of Afghanistan um, that they were getting. Um, so when I got back, she said, "You know, thanks for your service and all this." She was a uh, she goes, "You ought to write a book." And I was like, "I'm a product of the public education system. I can't write." She's going like, well, "I was an English major in college, so if you put my name on the cover." I'll uh, help you write your book. So she guided me through it. Um, and I was going to write it really only for my kids so that when they got older, they could say, oh, this is what he did in a story format, not a after action uh, briefing format. Um, so I ended up. Um, um, Took two and a half years to write. Very, very difficult writing parts of it because, and this was after I finished it, it was uh, very therapeutic, I found out, in helping me deal with all the shooting and all the, you know, the guys that were killed, that, you know, some of them that I knew uh, there in Afghanistan. So I didn't realize later that uh, it was very therapeutic in helping me deal with all that stuff. So that's what I tell people at speaking places that, um, definitely talk about what all went on to somebody professional. It's not a, it's not demeaning. It's not whatever you want to call it. You know, embarrassing to say like, dude, man, getting shot at is not the way to go through life. Um, right. It's a, it's the real deal. Um, so, ended up finishing the book, and it was number one bestseller when it came out uh, for the first two weeks. Um, and it's like, you know, your one podcast you had about self-publishing and everything. I mean, everything you said was exactly right. Um, when I was Thank almost you. finished with that, <laughs> do I? <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so when I was almost finished writing it, um, Sandra said, you need, we need to find a publisher. And so throughout the query letters and all to all the big people, uh, Presidio Press, the president of Presidio Press, um, he wrote me back saying, hey, what do you got? And I was, sent me some uh, sample chapters. Um, I sent him a couple. He wrote back within about 30 minutes saying like, wow, this is really good stuff. Um, you got something here, but you're going to sell four books. And <laughs> what do you mean? He's going to like, you going to sell one to mom, one to dad, one to grandma, and one to grandpa. He goes, is a good book. You've written it well, but uh, unless you're Chuck Yeager, uh, a first-time unknown author writing a war memoir that's a pilot, you're not going to sell anything. And um, he goes, unless you're Chuck Yeager or Corner or somebody like that, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, nobody's going to read it. Um, so that's what Sandra goes like, yeah, we'll show him. So that's why I went through the self-publishing route. Um, and pretty much, like I said, it was uh, number one on iUniverse, uh, their, their whatever you call it, publishing site. Uh, number one bestseller for the first two weeks, and then it was in the top seven uh, for the next four months after it came out. Um, wow. And then everybody was like, well, you know, well, and I guess you know, it's like, is it really that good, or are you just telling me it's good because you're my friend, or you're a friend of a friend, or something like that? You know, it's it's difficult to take somebody for an unsolicited um, review um, that you don't know. Because like I said, all of them, everybody said, oh, it's a great book, it's a great book. You know, they're all friends and family or friends of family and all that sort of stuff. So um, uh, I have, I know it came out good when, when I was selling them at gun shows and air shows and people were saying like uh, a month later, two months, whatever, come back and say, hey, I read your book. It was great. Or they contact me on uh, the book's webpage or whatever saying like, 
wow, thanks for uh, that was mm-hmm. you know excellent book. I've read it two times and I don't even you know read you know yep. stuff like that. And that also went into uh, a friend of the family. He's since uh, passed away. Uh, he was in Vietnam, a door gunner in the Huey in Vietnam. He had said like, wow, man, you got your videos, all the videos and pictures that go to all the battles in your book. You ought to make a movie. Um, and that kind of set the spark. So it took a couple of years of uh, kind of fishing around to where I got picked. I say, got, ended up being a producer on the, the movie uh, Apache Warrior. And then uh, through that and the contacts with that, they ended up making my movie Above the Best um, from the deal. So I know Above the Best was good because it's same, just like the book, how do you know it's really good? Because everybody that sees it is your family or friends and all that. Um, but on a lot of the question and answers after the, um, the movie, you know you did it right when a spouse would come up, and this has happened a lot, a spouse would come up and say, thank you so much for making this movie because my husband was in Iraq. He came back. He's been doing drugs, alcohol, whatever you want to call it. Um, we're fixing to get a divorce. And every time I ask him to try to help him, he ends up saying, like, uh, you wouldn't know. You weren't there. You wouldn't understand. You weren't there and this and that. And then he said, once we saw your movie, he said, like, see, that's what it's like. It's pure chaos. <laughs> it's pure chaos. And the stuff that happens, you're like, wow, that's just ridiculous, unbelievable, whatever you want to call it. Um, that's why, you know, you wouldn't understand. And then they'll say, like, now that we've seen your movie, now my husband is saying uh, he's going to seek professional help and, you know, coming back to us. And actually, I've got another story on that. Maybe we'll save that for the, um, the PTSD oh, uh, oh, the mental health thing. Okay, yeah, yeah. we can save we can save that that for the mental health thing. Uh, so when's the sequel? <laughs> uh, you know, it's funny you say that. Uh, literally two weeks ago, I was contacted by an extremely wealthy person that had me hook up with a local uh, movie producer. That um, we are waiting for him to. The next meeting we'll have will probably be in August with uh, the person that's going to fund. Um, a full feature movie. I'm available to play you if you need. Hey, me to play you. I need somebody <laughs> younger me. <laughs> and there you I'm go. I'm available. I can do it. Knows. Yeah, but you can't say I am the greatest. You got? That's, uh, I can't that's wear true. a panty on my head. I can't. I actually, yeah. I would be more like Tommy Lee Jones. Do not step here, here, or here. <laughs> there you go. Give him the yeah. pre-flight before. Well, we need a good Apache movie. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, so. So that's next uh, on the deal. As for another book, actually, uh, I'm working on that right now. Um, you should. Yeah. You've got. Uh, I mean, you got to put all the custom stuff in there. You got to put. You know. And that's, you, that's what it is. That's what it's going to be. It's going to be. The, you know, the issue and you, well, on writing a book is when I when I gave the rough copy to Sandra, she said like, "This is a bunch of small stories." You got to link them. You got to link them into a, a story. And um, so, yeah, that was, that's the issue is. Not necessarily. I mean, a lot of memoirs are just short stories. I mean, it's just a bunch of stories, you know. By the way, do you have an audiobook version of this? People are going to ask that question. Yeah, uh, I, I don't. I don't know how to go about that, much less. I'll I tell guess. you offline. I'll help you with that. That's easy. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. Easy thing. I mean, I, I cannot speak it because I don't have a. I've listened to some audio books and wow, those. If you get a good speaker, yeah, that could make a break a book or yeah, yeah. an audio book. Um, yeah, it, I, I can help you with that. It's on ACX, uh, ACX Audible Creative Exchange. It's yeah. really easy. So I, I'll 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 help you out with all that stuff. Well, awesome, man. Um, we usually take a, a couple questions from the audience if you have time. Um, yeah, I've got time. Um, I would, I would like just we'll, we'll just do it for like ten minutes. Nothing, nothing special. But uh, Will asked this all the way at the beginning. Uh, what's the deal with your hat? <laughs> I was in a cavalry squadron, Seventh Squadron, Sixth Cavalry Regiment. Actually, that's what it shows right there. The six over the seven. It's, yeah. Uh, that was my unit. Where you know, like the one forty third fighter squadron. That's so, sort of deal. So, 
Somebody yeah. thought you were a Confederate general. They were like, is he, why is he <laughs> and do that? But so the actual question, uh, because of air cav, cause I knew that was going to happen is, uh, how are pilot slots awarded? You didn't need a bachelor's or anything, right? You just straight up no. applied and, yes. and did that. Uh, I did have my associate's degree and I was working on my bachelor's. Um, the army still has high school to flight school. Okay. Um, it's, drinking from a fire hydrant. I personally don't know anybody that's done it, but I do have very close friends that know people that have gone high school to flight school. It is, it's a, it's drinking from a fire hydrant, especially for an 18 or 19 year old kid. Um, I mean, could you imagine that if you were 19 years old, you know, when you sold it in the 152, 172, whatever, uh, going in right from that into the Hornet. Systems on an Apache? No. <laughs> yeah, all that stuff. So it's Tactics. been done, and uh, but it's, wow, yeah, it's drinking from a fire hydrant. But it can be done. Yeah. Uh, this is more of a statement. Uh, thank you for, good job for years, Air Cav hat. Woo, there you go. Well, I don't know. This is the funny thing on here. These little knots on the side are uh those are combat knots is what we call them and um they are uh once you've been in combat then you know you put them on we normally wear like i said that little um uh, flechette it's stuck in here and this is a real flechette um they um uh, and then obviously i was a master aviator when i retired my rank uh cw4 and then the uh, the cavalry uh, insignia on there and then you'll see other guys with on the back they'll put uh, their own stuff so this was the combat pin it's there right there uh, from McDonnell Douglas the uh, actual uh, gold uh, flying the Apache in combat uh, yeah American flag uh, the gold flechette from BAE rocket systems they're the ones that make the uh, the rockets that we fired and these were my original wings from uh, U.S. Customs on there. The oh, back awesome. of it is what, um, whatever you want to put. It yeah. Is, uh, yeah, it's whatever you want to put on the back. But, uh, so, yeah. Uh, hello from former commander at 7-6, front seater. Yeah, Colonel Dupree, yes. Uh, incredible. I got to shoot, uh, yeah, yes. We both got to shoot Hellfires together in uh, your gunnery back at Fort Hood years ago, back in the 1900s, 1990 six or seven or something like that incredible cap or colonel yeah <laughs> awesome well last question comes from baghdaddy mike commissioner warrant what do you recommend for those that want to be like you <laughs> um warrant and i yeah. and yeah because you fly you can fly your i flew for my entire 21 years in flying like i said i was five years infantry beforehand but um as a warrant officer, you can fly your entire career. Uh, that's the difference between a commission and warrant. Commission, obviously, uh, you're a manager. You still get to fly, but once you make 04, yeah, your flying goes down tremendously, drastically. Um, what I would, you know, like I said, uh, as you were saying, if you wanted my route, I would do my route again, which is infantry. Um, long range recon, uh, ranger if you could, uh, and, or you know, ranger airborne and all that. Only because when you're young, it's fun. Um, yeah. It's a lot of work, a lot of walking, but and getting to shoot all the machine guns and you know, uh, rocket launchers and all that sort of stuff. It's a blast. Uh, it's an absolute blast. You get to do some really cool stuff. Um, but that set me up as an enlisted soldier. Uh, and I, you know, how do you say this without? tooting your own horn um you that's what this is for toot your own horn that's what we're here uh, for you you know what it's like to be enlisted so our enlisted mechanics uh, you know my sergeants and all that to me they were absolutely equals to me treated them one like human beings but two they were equal to me um whereas let me see, I'm like, how do you say this uh there's some that were never enlisted prior that were warrant officers and then there's obviously some commission that were never enlisted that 
uh, definitely looked down upon the enlisted and all that. But if it wasn't for the mechanics, um, the enlisted yeah. corps, the NCO corps, yeah, we'd never get flying. But uh, and I know I did it right when I finished when I retired from the army flying the Apache. As I was walking out the door, the enlisted that were, that were with us there in Afghanistan would stop me and say, "Like, Mr. Flores, I heard you're you're retiring. You can't be retiring. I'm fixing to go to flight school because of you." I want to be like you, and I wanted you to train me when I got back, all that stuff. So, yeah, that's when you know it's the right time to leave, <laughs> not awesome. where they're kicking you out the door. That's so. awesome. Well, Mr. Flores, absolute pleasure. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, what's a good place to find you online if they want to follow <laughs> you or see what's the next? Or yeah. do you have a website? What do we got? Um, obviously, Facebook. Uh, Daniel Flores uh, on Facebook, um, and it's the one with me. I forgot which one it is, because the publisher made a second Facebook page. Um, I don't know why they did that. So I'm on Facebook. You'll see me. I'll, I'm the one with all the the videos with uh, flying. Um, Daniel South of Heaven dot com, all one word. That's the book's website. Um, above the best film that's on Facebook um, I don't run that but obviously my producer director runs it and so I can get in touch with them yeah Daniel south of heaven yeah dot com um, I know man some people are so good at this <laughs> uh, where else I'll be at Oshkosh I'll be screening my movie above yeah. the best at Oshkosh good. Tuesday July 27th at one o'clock in the skyscape theater um, and I was fortunate enough that the person that was going to be showing their film behind me canceled. So I get a full three hours or two and a half hours. Uh, the film is an hour and 20 minutes. So I get that much time to answer questions oh, that's uh, awesome. after that. Yeah. So it'll, uh, and there's a lot of questions, a lot of great questions at, at uh, when I do film screens. I mean, some, seriously, some people think they're stupid questions, but man, I'm telling you, there's some really, really good questions. Uh, well, if you uh, see so a man with a shirt that says Top of T's and no WC's, please uh, stop him and say hello because he taught me how to fly helicopters. Wait, wait, wait. Say that again now? If you see a man with a bulbous helmet that says 3G's, Top of T, no WC's, fuel's good for about an hour, Lester will be there wearing his shirt. That's what I'm doing. Oh, oh, oh right. yeah. I'd love to be Lester. Holy man. Lester, <laughs> Lester is supposed to be going to Oshkosh. And I told him to wear the shirt, and he said, I've got four of them. I said, please, Lester, please. And I can't wait to hear back from that. So. Yeah. Oh, man. That, yeah, that'd be great. Lester's pretty cool. I like him. <laughs> He's a trip. He's a trip. Well, I, honestly, I appreciate your story. I'm, I'm so glad that you reached out. Thank you so much for sending me the books, and, and, and thank you so much for – uh, coming on the channel, telling your story. Uh, thanks for your service. I know a year in Afghanistan, it's more than anything I've ever done. So, uh, dude, you're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Moover, man. You have a great night. Thanks again. We'll get back in touch for the audio book and the mental uh, mental one. Uh, yeah, no, that's a that's a really good topic that I really want to explore more. I just, it'll be better on a different one. So, thank you, everybody, for watching. Have a good night. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.